Section 12 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. Part 3 The Winning of a Queen. So, having told you how King Arthur obtained that very excellent sword, Excalibur, for a weapon of defence, I shall now presently recount sundry other noble and knightly adventures, whereby he won for himself a most beautiful and gentle lady for his queen. For, though all the world is very well acquainted with the renown of that perfectly gracious dame, the Lady Guinevere, yet I do not think that the whole story of those adventures by the which King Arthur won her good favour hath ever yet been told. So, as the matter hereinafter to be related contains not only the narrative of that affair, but also the account of a certain enchanted disguise which King Arthur assumed for his purposes, as well as sundry adventures of very knightly daring which he undertook, I have great hope that he who reads what I have written shall find it both an agreeable and an entertaining history. Chapter First how King Arthur went to Tintagalon with four of his court, and how he disguised himself for a certain purpose. Now upon a certain day King Arthur proclaimed a high feast, which was held at Carleon upon Usk. Many noble guests were bidden, and an exceedingly splendid court gathered at the king's castle. For at that feast there sat seven kings and five queens in royal state, and there were high lords and beautiful ladies of degree, to the number of threescore and seven. And there were a multitude of those famous knights of the king's court, who were reckoned the most renowned in arms in all of Christendom. And of all this great gathering of kings, lords, and knights, not one man looked askance at his neighbour, but all were united in good fellowship. Wherefore, when the young king looked about him, and beheld such peace and amity among all these noble lords, where aforetime had been discord and ill-regard. Certes, quoth he to himself, it is wonderful how this reign of mine hath knit men together in kindness and good fellowship. And because of such thoughts as these, his spirit took wings like unto a bird, and sang within him. Now while the king sat thus at feast, lo, there came an herald messenger from the west country, and the herald came and stood before the king, and said, Greeting to thee, King Arthur. And then the king said, Speak, and tell me what is thy message. To which the herald made reply, I come from King Leodegrans of Cameliard, who is in sore trouble, for thus it is. His enemy and thine enemy, King Ryans of North Wales, he who at one time in contempt of thee commanded thee to send him thy beard for to trim his mantle, doth make sundry demands of my master, King Leodegrance, which demands King Leodegrance is altogether loath to fulfil. And King Ryance of North Wales threateneth to bring war into Cameliard, because King Leodegrance doth not immediately fulfil those demands. Now King Leodegrance hath no such array of knights and armed men as he one time had gathered about him for to defend his kingdom against assault. For, since thou and thy majesty hath brought peace to this realm, and hath reduced the power of all those kings under thee, those knights who once made the court of King Leodegrance so famous have gone elsewhither for to seek better opportunities for their great valour and prowess at arms than his peaceful court may afford. Wherefore my master, King Leodegrance, doth beseech aid of thee, who art his king and overlord." To these things that the herald messenger said, King Arthur and all that court that feasted with him listened in entire silence. And the king's countenance, which erstwhiles had been expanded with cheerfulness, became overcast and dark with anger. Ha! he cried, this is verily no good news that thou hast brought hither to our feast. Now I will give what aid I am able to thy master, King Leodegrance, in this extremity, and that right speedily. But tell me, Sir Herald, what things are they that King Ryance demandeth of thy master? 
That I will tell you, Lord, quoth the herald messenger. Firstly, King Ryance maketh demand upon my master of a great part of those lands of Cameliard that march upon the borders of North Wales. Secondly, he maketh demand that the Lady Guinevere, the king's daughter, be delivered in marriage unto Duke Mordaunt of North Umber, who is of kin unto King Ryance. And that duke, though a mighty warrior, is so evil of appearance and so violent of temper, that I believe that there is not his like for ugliness or for madness of humour in all the world." Now when King Arthur heard this that the messenger said, he was immediately seized with an extraordinary passion of anger. For his eyes appeared, and it were, to shoot forth sparks of pure light, his face flamed like fire, and he ground his teeth together like the stones of a kern. Then he immediately rose from the chair where he sat, and went forth from that place, and all those who beheld his anger shuddered thereat, and turned their eyes away from his countenance. Then King Arthur went into an inner room of the castle by himself, and there he walked up and down for a great while, and in that time no one of his household dared to come nigh to him. And the reason of the king's wrath was this, that ever since he had lain wounded and sick nigh unto death in the forest, he bare in mind how the Lady Guinevere had suddenly appeared before him like some tall, straight, shining angel who had descended unto him out of paradise, all full of pity and exceedingly beautiful. Wherefore, at thought of that wicked, mad Duke Mordaunt of North Umber, making demand unto marriage with her, he was seized with a rage so violent that it shook his spirit like a mighty wind. So for a long while he walked up and down in his wrath, as aforesaid, and no one durst come nigh unto him, but all stood afar off, watching him from a distance. Then after a while he gave command that Merlin, and Sir Ulfius, and Sir Kay should come to him at that place where he was. And when they had come thither, he talked to them for a considerable time, bidding Merlin for to make ready to go upon a journey with him, and bidding Sir Ulfius and Sir Kay for to gather together a large army of chosen knights and armed men, and to bring that army straightway into those parts coadjacent to the royal castle of Tintagalon, which same standeth close to the borders of North Wales and of Cameliard. So Sir Ulfius and Sir Kay went about to do as King Arthur commanded, and Merlin also went about to do as he commanded. And the next day King Arthur and Merlin, together with certain famous knights of the king's court, who were the most approved at arms of all those about him, to wit, Sir Gawain and Sir Erwin, who were nephews unto the king, and Sir Pelias and Sir Geraint, the son of Erban, set forth for Tintagalon across the forest land of Osk. So they travelled for all that day, and a part of the next, and that without adventure or misadventure of any sort. So they came, at last, to that large and noble castle hight Tintagalon, which guards the country bordering upon Cameliard and North Wales. Here King Arthur was received with great rejoicing, for whithersoever the king went, the people loved him very dearly. Wherefore the folk of Tintagalon were very glad when he came unto them. Now the morning after King Arthur had come unto Tintagalon, the summer night having been very warm, he and Merlin were glad to arise betimes to go abroad, for to enjoy the dewy freshness of the early daytime. So in the cool of the day they walked together in the garden, which was a very pleasant place, and beneath the shadow of a tall straight tower. And all around about were many trees with a good shade, where the little birds sang sweetly in the cheerfulness of the summer weather. And here King Arthur opened his mind very freely to Merlin, and he said, Merlin, I do believe that the Lady Guinevere is the fairest lady in all of the world, wherefore my heart seems ever to be entirely filled with love for her, and that to such a degree that I think of her continually by day, whether I be eating, or drinking, or walking, or sitting still, or going about my business, and likewise I dream of her many times at night. And this has been the case with me, Merlin, ever since a month ago, when I lay sick in that hermit's cell in the forest, what time she came and stood beside me like a shining angel out of paradise. So I am not willing that any other man than I should have her for his wife. Now I know very well that thou art wonderfully cunning in those arts of magic, that may change a man in his appearance, so that even those who know him best may not recognize him. Wherefore I very greatly desired of thee, 
that thou wilt so disguise me that I may go unknown of any man into Cameliard, and that I may dwell there in such a way that I may see the Lady Guinevere every day. For I tell thee very truly that I greatly desire to behold her in such a wise that she may not be in any way witting of my regard. Likewise, I would fain see for myself how great may be the perils that encompass King Leodegrance, the king being my right good friend. My lord king, said Merlin, it shall be as thou desirest, and this morning I will cause thee to be so disguised that no one in all the world shall be able to know thee who thou art. So that morning, a little before the prime, Merlin came unto the king where he was, and gave him a little cap. And the cap was of such a sort that when the king set it upon his head, he assumed upon the instant the appearance of a rude and rustic fellow from the countryside. Then the king commanded that a jerkin of rough frieze should be brought to him, and with this he covered his royal and knightly vestments, and with it he hid that golden collar and its jewel pendant, which he continually wore about his neck. Then, setting the cap upon his head, he assumed at once the guise of that peasant hind. Whereupon, being thus entirely disguised, he quitted Tintigalon, unknown of any man, and took his way afoot unto the town of Cameliard. Now toward the slanting of the day he drew nigh to that place, and, lo, he beheld before him a large and considerable town of many comely houses with red walls and shining windows. And the houses of the town sat all upon a high steep hill, the one overlooking the other, and the town itself was encompassed around about by a great wall, high and strong. And a great castle guarded the town, and the castle had very many towers and roofs. And all round about the tower were many fair gardens and lawns and meadows, and several orchards and groves of trees with thick and pleasing shade. Now at that time of the day the sky behind the tower was all, as it were, an entire flame of fire, so that the towers and the battlements of the castle and the roofs and the chimneys thereof stood altogether black against the brightness of the light. And behold, great flocks of pigeons encircled the towers of the castle, in a continual flight against that fiery sky. So, because King Arthur was aweary with walking for all that day, it appeared to him that he had hardly ever beheld in all of his life so fair and pleasing a place as that excellent castle with its gardens and lawns and groves of trees. Thus came King Arthur unto the castle of Cameliard, in the guise of a poor peasant from the countryside, and no man in all of the world knew him who he was. So, having reached the castle, he made inquiries for the head gardener thereof, and when he had speech with the gardener, he besought him that he might be taken into service in that part of the garden that appertained to the dwelling-place of the Lady Guinevere. Then the gardener looked upon him, and saw that he was tall and strong and well-framed, wherefore he liked him very well, and took him into service, even as he desired. And thus it was that King Arthur of Britain became a gardener's boy at Cameliard. End of section 12《Section 13 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3. The Winning of a Queen. Chapter First, Part Two. Now the king was very glad to be in that garden, for in this pleasant summer season the Lady Guinevere came every day to walk with her damsels among the flowers, and King Arthur, all disguised as a peasant gardener boy, beheld her very many times when she came thither. So King Arthur abode at that place for above a week and he took no care that in all that time he enjoyed none of his kingly estate, but was only gardener's boy in the castle garden of Cameliard. Now it happened upon a day when the weather was very warm, that one of the damsels who was in attendance upon the Lady Guinevere arose all in the early morning whilst the air was still cool and refreshing. So leaving the Lady Guinevere still sleeping, this damsel, whose name was 
Melisine of the White Hand, went into the anteroom, and, opening the casement thereof, looked forth into that garden of roses which adjoined the Lady Guinevere's bower. Now there was at that place a carven marble figure of a youth, holding in his arms a marble ewer, and a fountain of water as clear as crystal flowed out from the ewer into a basin of marble. And the figure and the fountain and the marble basin into which the fountain flowed lay beneath the shadow of a linden tree, and all around was a thick growth of roses, so that the place was entirely hidden, saving only from those windows of the castle that were above. So it befell that as the damsel looked down thitherward out of the window, she beheld a very wonderful sight, for lo, a strange knight kneeled beside the fountain, and bathed his face and his bosom in the crystal water thereof. And the damsel saw that the sunlight fell down through the leaves of the linden tree, and lay upon that strange knight. And she perceived that his hair and his beard were of the color of red gold, shining surpassingly in the brightness of the morning. And she beheld that his brow and his throat and his bosom were white like alabaster. And she beheld that around his neck and shoulders there hung a golden collar of marvellous beauty, so that when the sunlight shone upon it, it flashed like pure lightning. So beholding this strange appearance, as it were a vision, the damsel Melisine stood for a long while, all entranced with wonder and with pleasure, and wist not whether that which she saw was a dream or no dream, nor whether he who sat there was a spirit or whether he was a man of flesh and blood. Then, by and by, recovering somewhat from her astonishment, she withdrew herself softly from the casement, and, turning about, ran fleetly down the turret stairs, and so came out thence into that fair and blooming garden at the foot of the tower. So she ran through the garden with all speed and silence, and thus came down an alleyway, and to the marble fountain, and the linden trees, and the rose trees, around about where she had anon beheld that strange knight bathing himself in the crystal waters. But King Arthur had heard the coming of that damsel, and had speedily set the cap upon his head again, so that when the damsel Melisine came thither, she found no one by the fountain but the gardener's boy. Of him she demanded, Who art thou, fellow? And why sittest thou here by the fountain? And unto her he replied, I am the gardener's lad, who came a short time ago to take service at this place. Then tell me, fellow, quoth she, and tell me truly, who was that young knight who was here beside the fountain but now, and whither hath he gone? Lady, whereunto, he said, there has been no one at this fountain this day, but only I. Nay, fellow, she cried, thou art deceiving me, for I do assure thee that with mine own eyes I beheld but now, where a strange young knight sat bathing himself in the waters of this fountain. And the gardener's boy said, Lady, that which I have told you is the very truth, for indeed there hath no one been here this morn but only I. Wherefore, an thou deemest thou hast seen any one else, thou art certainly mistaken. At this the damsel set her look upon him in great perplexity. Likewise she marvelled very greatly, for she could not altogether disbelieve him, nor yet could she entirely believe him either, because her eyes had beheld that which she had beheld, and she wotted that she had not been mistaken. Therefore she knew not what to think, and because of her perplexity she felt a very great displeasure at that gardener's boy. Truly, wherefore, she said, if thou art deceiving me, I shall certainly cause thee to suffer a great deal of pain, for I shall have thee whipped with cords." Thereupon she turned and went away from that place, much marvelling at that strange thing, and wondering what it all signified. That morning she told unto the Lady Guinevere all that she had seen, but the Lady Guinevere only laughed at her and mocked her, telling her that she had been asleep and dreaming when she beheld that vision. And, indeed, the damsel herself had begun to think this must be the case. Nevertheless, she thereafter looked out every morning from her casement window, albeit she beheld nothing for a great while, for King Arthur came not soon to that place again. So by and by there befell another certain morning, when she looked out of the casement, and, lo, there sat that strange knight by the fountain once more, as he had aforetime sat. 
and he bathed his face and his bosom in the water as he had aforetime done and he appeared as comely and as noble as he had appeared before and his hair and his young beard shone like gold as they had shone before in the sun and this time she beheld that his collar of gold lay upon the brink of the fountain beside him and it sparkled with great splendour in the sunlight the whiles he bathed his bosom then after that damsel had regarded him for a considerable time she ran with all speed to the chamber where the lady guinevere still lay and she cried in a loud voice lady lady arouse thee and come with me for lo that same young knight whom i beheld before is even now bathing himself at the fountain under the linden tree then the lady guinevere greatly marvelling aroused herself right quickly and dighting herself with all speed went with the damsel unto that casement window which looked out into that part of the garden and there she herself beheld the young knight where he laved himself at the fountain and she saw that his hair and his beard shone like gold in the sunlight and she saw that his under vestment was of purple linen threaded with gold and she saw that beside him lay that cunningly wrought collar of gold inset with many jewels of various colours and the collar shone with great splendour where it lay upon the marble verge of the fountain some while she gazed exceedingly astonished then she commanded the damsel melusine for to come with her and therewith she turned and ascended the turret stairs and went quickly out into the garden as her damsel had done aforetime then as that damsel had done she straightway hastened with all speed down the alleyway toward the fountain but behold when she had come there she found no young knight but only the gardener boy exactly as had happened with the damsel melusine aforetime for king arthur had heard her coming and had immediately put that enchanted cap upon his head then the lady guinevere marvelled very greatly to find there only the gardener's boy and she wist not what to think of so strange a thing wherefore she demanded of him even as melusine had done whither had gone the young knight whom she had beheld anon there at the fountain and unto her the gardener lad made answer as aforetime lady there hath been no one at this place at any time this morning but only i now when king arthur had donned his cap at the coming of the lady he had in his great haste forgotten his golden collar and this guinevere beheld where it lay shining very brightly beside the margin of the fountain how now quoth she wouldst thou dare to make a mock of me now tell me thou fellow do gardeners boys in the land whence thou didst come wear golden collars about their necks like unto that collar that lieth yonder beside the fountain now an i had thee well whipped it would be thy rightful due but take thou that bauble yonder and give it unto him to whom it doth rightfully belong and tell him from me that it doth ill become a true belted knight for to hide himself away in the privy gardens of a lady then turned she with the damsel melusine and left she that place and went back again into her bower yet indeed for all that day as she sat over her broidery she did never cease to marvel and to wonder how it was possible that that strange young knight should so suddenly have vanished away and left only the poor gardener's boy in his stead nor for a long time might she unriddle that strange thing then of a sudden at that time when the heat of the day was sloping toward the cooler part of the afternoon she aroused herself because of a thought that had come in an instant unto her so she called the damsel melusine to come to her and she bade her to go and tell the gardener's lad for to fetch her straightway a basket of fresh roses for to adorn her tower chamber so melusine went and did as she bade and after considerable time the gardener's lad came bearing a great basket of roses and lo he wore his cap upon his head and all the damsels in waiting upon the lady guinevere when they saw how he wore his cap in her presence cried out upon him and melusine of the white hand demanded of him what how now sir boar dost thou know so little of what is due unto a king's daughter that thou dost wear thy cap even in the presence of the lady guinevere now i bid thee straightway to take thy cap off thy head and to her king arthur made answer lady i cannot take off my cap quoth the lady guinevere and why canst thou not take off thy cap thou surly fellow lady said he i cannot take off my cap 
because I have an ugly place upon my head. Then wear thy cap, quoth the Lady Guinevere, only fetch thou the roses unto me. And so at her bidding he brought the roses to her. But when he had come nigh unto the lady, she of a sudden snatched at the cap and plucked it off from his head. Then, lo, he was upon the instant transformed. For instead of the gardener's boy, there stood before the Lady Guinevere and her damsel the appearance of a noble young knight with hair and beard like threads of gold. Then he let fall his basket of roses, so that the flowers were scattered all over the floor. And he stood and looked at all who were there. And some of those damsels and attendants upon the Lady Guinevere shrieked, and others stood still from pure amazement, and wist not how to believe what their eyes beheld. But not one of those ladies knew that he whom she beheld was King Arthur. Nevertheless the Lady Guinevere remembered that this was the knight whom she had found so sorely wounded, lying in the hermit's cell in the forest. Then she laughed, and flung him back his cap again. "'Take thy cap,' quoth she, "'and go thy ways, thou gardener's boy, who hath an ugly place upon his head.' Thus she said, because she was minded to mock him. But King Arthur did not reply to her, but straightway, with great sobriety of aspect, set his cap upon his head again. So, resuming his humble guise once more, he turned and quitted that place, leaving those roses scattered all over the floor, even as they had fallen. And, after that time, whenever the Lady Guinevere would come upon the gardener's lad in the garden, she would say unto her damsel in such a voice that he might hear her speech, Lo, yonder is the gardener's lad, who hath an ugly place upon his head, so that he must always wear his cap for to hide it. Thus she spake openly, mocking at him. But privily she bade her damsels to say naught concerning these things, but to keep unto themselves all those things which had befallen. End of section 13《セクション13 of the story of King Arthur and his knights。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and his Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3. The Winning of a Queen. Chapter First, Part Two. Now the king was very glad to be in that garden, for in this pleasant summer season the Lady Guinevere came every day to walk with her damsels among the flowers, and King Arthur, all disguised as a peasant gardener boy, beheld her very many times when she came thither. So King Arthur abode at that place for above a week and he took no care that in all that time he enjoyed none of his kingly estate, but was only gardener's boy in the castle garden of Cameliard. Now it happened upon a day when the weather was very warm, that one of the damsels who was in attendance upon the Lady Guinevere arose all in the early morning whilst the air was still cool and refreshing. So leaving the Lady Guinevere still sleeping, this damsel, whose name was Melisine of the White Hand, went into the ante-room, and, opening the casement thereof, looked forth into that garden of roses which adjoined the Lady Guinevere's bower. Now there was at that place a carven marble figure of a youth, holding in his arms a marble ewer, and a fountain of water as clear as crystal flowed out from the ewer into a basin of marble. And the figure, and the fountain, and the marble basin into which the fountain flowed, lay beneath the shadow of a linden tree and all around was thick growth of roses, so that the place was entirely hidden, saving only from those windows of the castle that were above. So it befell that as the damsel looked down thitherward out of the window, she beheld a very wonderful sight, for lo, a strange knight kneeled beside the fountain, and bathed his face and his bosom in the crystal water thereof. And the damsel saw that the sunlight fell down through the leaves of the linden tree, and lay upon that strange knight. And she perceived that his hair and his beard were of the color of red gold, shining surpassingly in the brightness of the morning. And she beheld that his brow and his throat and his bosom were white like alabaster. 
and she beheld that around his neck and shoulders there hung a golden collar of marvellous beauty, so that when the sunlight shone upon it, it flashed like pure lightning. So beholding this strange appearance, as it were a vision, the damsel Melusine stood for a long while all entranced with wonder and with pleasure, and wist not whether that which she saw was a dream or no dream, nor whether he who sat there was a spirit, or whether he was a man of flesh and blood. Then, by and by, recovering somewhat from her astonishment, she withdrew herself softly from the casement, and, turning about, ran fleetly down the turret stairs, and so came out thence into that fair and blooming garden at the foot of the tower. So she ran through the garden with all speed and silence, and thus came down an alleyway, and to the marble fountain, and the linden trees, and the rose trees, around about where she had anon beheld that strange knight bathing himself in the crystal waters. But King Arthur had heard the coming of that damsel, and had speedily set the cap upon his head again. So that when the damsel Melusine came thither, she found no one by the fountain but the gardener's boy. Of him she demanded, Who art thou, fellow, and why sittest thou here by the fountain? And unto her he replied, I am the gardener's lad, who came a short time ago to take service at this place. Then tell me, fellow, quoth she, and tell me truly, who was that young knight who was here beside the fountain but now, and whither hath he gone? Lady, whereunto, he said, there has been no one at this fountain this day, but only I. Nay, fellow, she cried, thou art deceiving me, for I do assure thee that with mine own eyes I beheld but now, where a strange young knight sat bathing himself in the waters of this fountain. And the gardener's boy said, Lady, that which I have told you is the very truth, for indeed there hath no one been here this morn but only I. Wherefore, an thou deemest thou hast seen any one else, thou art certainly mistaken. At this the damsel set her look upon him in great perplexity. Likewise she marvelled very greatly, for she could not altogether disbelieve him, nor yet could she entirely believe him either, because her eyes had beheld that which she had beheld, and she wotted that she had not been mistaken. Therefore she knew not what to think, and because of her perplexity she felt a very great displeasure at that gardener's boy. Truly, wherefore, she said, if thou art deceiving me, I shall certainly cause thee to suffer a great deal of pain, for I shall have thee whipped with cords. Thereupon she turned and went away from that place, much marvelling at that strange thing, and wondering what it all signified. That morning she told unto the Lady Guinevere all that she had seen, but the Lady Guinevere only laughed at her and mocked her, telling her that she had been asleep and dreaming when she beheld that vision. And, indeed, the damsel herself had begun to think this must be the case. Nevertheless, she thereafter looked out every morning from her casement window, albeit she beheld nothing for a great while, for King Arthur came not soon to that place again. So, by and by, there befell another certain morning, when she looked out of the casement, and, lo, there sat that strange knight by the fountain once more, as he had aforetime sat. And he bathed his face and his bosom in the water, as he had aforetime done. And he appeared as comely and as noble as he had appeared before, and his hair and his young beard shone like gold, as they had shone before in the sun. And this time she beheld that his collar of gold lay upon the brink of the fountain beside him, and it sparkled with great splendour in the sunlight the whiles he bathed his bosom. Then, after that damsel had regarded him for a considerable time, she ran with all speed to the chamber where the Lady Guinevere still lay, and she cried in a loud voice, Lady, Lady, arouse thee and come with me, for lo, that same young knight whom I beheld before is even now bathing himself at the fountain under the linden tree. Then the Lady Guinevere, greatly marvelling, aroused herself right quickly, and, dighting herself with all speed, went with the damsel unto that casement window, which looked out into that part of the garden. And there she herself beheld the young knight, where he laved himself at the fountain, and she saw that his hair and his beard shone like gold in the sunlight, and she saw that his under-vestment was of purple linen threaded with gold, 
and she saw that beside him lay that cunningly wrought collar of gold and set with many jewels of various colours and the collar shone with great splendour where it lay upon the marble verge of the fountain some while she gazed exceedingly astonished then she commanded the damsel melisine for to come with her and therewith she turned and ascended the turret stairs and went quickly out into the garden as her damsel had done aforetime then as that damsel had done she straightway hastened with all speed down the alleyway toward the fountain but behold when she had come there she found no young knight but only the gardener boy exactly as had happened with the damsel melisine aforetime for king arthur had heard her coming and had immediately put that enchanted cap upon his head then the lady guinevere marvelled very greatly to find there only the gardener's boy and she wist not what to think of so strange a thing wherefore she demanded of him even as melisine had done whither had gone the young knight whom she had beheld anon there at the fountain and unto her the gardener lad made answer as aforetime lady there hath been no one at this place at any time this morning but only i now when king arthur had donned his cap at the coming of the lady he had in his great haste forgotten his golden collar and this guinevere beheld where it lay shining very brightly beside the margin of the fountain how now quoth she wouldst thou dare to make a mock of me now tell me thou fellow do gardeners boys in the land whence thou didst come wear golden collars about their necks like unto that collar that lieth yonder beside the fountain now an i had thee well whipped it would be thy rightful due but take thou that bauble yonder and give it unto him to whom it doth rightfully belong and tell him from me that it doth ill become a true belted knight for to hide himself away in the privy gardens of a lady then turned she with the damsel melisine and left she that place and went back again into her bower yet indeed for all that day as she sat over her broidery she did never cease to marvel and to wonder how it was possible that that strange young knight should so suddenly have vanished away and left only the poor gardener's boy in his stead nor for a long time might she unriddle that strange thing then of a sudden at that time when the heat of the day was sloping toward the cooler part of the afternoon she aroused herself because of a thought that had come in an instant unto her so she called the damsel melisine to come to her and she bade her to go and tell the gardener's lad for to fetch her straightway a basket of fresh roses for to adorn her tower chamber so melisine went and did as she bade and after considerable time the gardener's lad came bearing a great basket of roses and lo he wore his cap upon his head and all the damsels in waiting upon the lady guinevere when they saw how he wore his cap in her presence cried out upon him and melisine of the white hand demanded of him what how now sir bore dost thou know so little of what is due unto a king's daughter that thou dost wear thy cap even in the presence of the lady guinevere now i bid thee straightway to take thy cap off thy head and to her king arthur made answer lady i cannot take off my cap quoth the lady guinevere and why canst thou not take off thy cap thou surly fellow lady said he i cannot take off my cap because i have an ugly place upon my head then wear thy cap quoth the lady guinevere only fetch thou the roses unto me and so at her bidding he brought the roses to her but when he had come nigh unto the lady she of a sudden snatched at the cap and plucked it off from his head then lo he was upon the instant transformed for instead of the gardener's boy there stood before the lady guinevere and her damsel the appearance of a noble young knight with hair and beard like threads of gold then he let fall his basket of roses so that the flowers were scattered all over the floor and he stood and looked at all who were there and some of those damsels in attendance upon the lady guinevere shrieked and others stood still from pure amazement and wist not how to believe what their eyes beheld but not one of those ladies knew that he whom she beheld was king arthur nevertheless the lady guinevere remembered that this was the knight whom she had found so sorely wounded lying in the hermit's cell in the forest then she laughed and flung him back his cap again take thy cap quoth she and go thy ways thou gardener's boy who hath an ugly place upon his head thus she said because she was minded to mock him 
But King Arthur did not reply to her, but straightway, with great sobriety of aspect, set his cap upon his head again. So, resuming his humble guise once more, he turned and quitted that place, leaving those roses scattered all over the floor, even as they had fallen. And, after that time, whenever the Lady Guinevere would come upon the gardener's lad in the garden, she would say unto her damsel in such a voice that he might hear her speech, Lo, yonder is the gardener's lad, who hath an ugly place upon his head, so that he must always wear his cap for to hide it. Thus she spake openly, mocking at him. But privily she bade her damsels to say naught concerning these things, but to keep unto themselves all those things which had befallen. End of section 13《ซ c t i o n 14 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3. The Winning of a Queen. Chapter Second, How King Ryance Came to Cameliard, and How King Arthur Fought with the Duke of North Umber. Now upon a certain day at this time there came a messenger to the court of King Leodegrans, with news that King Ryance of North Wales and Duke Mardaunt of North Umber were coming thither, and that they brought with them a very noble and considerable court of knights and lords. At this news King Leodegrance was much troubled in spirit, for he wist not what such a visit might betoken, and yet he greatly feared that it boded ill for him. So on that day when King Ryance and the Duke of North Umber appeared before the castle, King Leodegrance went forth to greet them, and they three met together in the meadows that lie beneath the castle walls of Cameliard. There King Leodegrance bade those others welcome in such manner as was fitting, desiring them that they should come into the castle with him, so that he might entertain them according to their degree. But to this courtesy upon the part of King Leodegrance, King Ryance deigned no pleasing reply. Nay, quoth he, we go not with thee into thy castle, King Leodegrance, until we learn whether thou art our friend or our enemy. For just now we are, certes, no such good friends with thee, that we care to sit down at thy table and eat of thy salt. Nor may we be aught but enemies of thine, until thou hast first satisfied our demands. To wit, that thou givest to me those lands which I demand of thee, and that thou givest unto my cousin, Duke Mardaunt of North Umber, the Lady Guinevere, to be his wife." In these matters thou hast it in thy power to make us either thy friends or thine enemies. Wherefore we shall abide here outside of thy castle for five days, in the which time thou mayst frame thine answer, and so we may know whether we shall be friends or enemies. And in the meantime, quoth Duke Mardant of North Umber, I do hold myself ready for to contest my right unto the hand of the Lady Guinevere with any knight of thy court, who hath a mind to deny my just title thereto. And if thou hast no knight in all thy court who can successfully assay a bout of arms with me, thou thyself canst hardly hope to succeed in defending thyself against that great army of knights whom King Ryance hath gathered together to bring against thee in case thou deniest us that which we ask. Then was King Leodegrance exceedingly cast down in his spirits, for he feared those proud lords, and he wist not what to say in answer to them. Wherefore he turned and walked back into his castle again, beset with great anxiety and sorrow of spirit. And King Ryance and Duke Mordaunt and their court of lords and knights pitched their pavilions in those meadows over against the castle, so that the plain was entirely covered with those pavilions. And there they took up their inn with great rejoicing, and with the sound of feasting and singing and merry-making, for it was an exceeding noble court King Ryance had gathered about him. And when the next morning had come, Duke Mordaunt of North Umber went forth clad all in armour of proof, 
and he rode up and down the field before the castle and gave great challenge to those within daring any knight to come forth for to meet him in knightly encounter ho he cried how now ye knights of cameliard is there no one to come forth to meet me how then may ye hope to contend with the knights of north wales and ye fear to meet with one single knight from north umber so he scoffed at them in his pride and none dared to come forth from cameliard against him for the duke of northumber was one of the most famous knights of his day and one of exceeding strength and success at arms and there was now in these times of peace no one of king leodegrance's court who was at all able to face a warrior of his approved skill and valour wherefore no one took up that challenge which the duke of northumber gave to the court of cameliard meantime many people gathered upon the walls of cameliard and gazed down therefrom upon that proud and haughty duke all bedight in his splendid armour and all were grieved and ashamed that there was no one in that peaceful town to go out against him and all the lords and knights of king ryance's court came and stood in front of the king's pavilion and laughed and clapped their hands together and cheered duke mordaunt as he so rode up and down before them and the greater they were expanded with mirth the more abashed were the people of cameliard ho ho cried that proud duke how now will no one come forth to meet me how then may ye of cameliard hope to face the king of north wales and all his knightly array of which i am but one man and the people of cameliard gathered upon the walls listened to him with shame and sorrow now all this while king arthur digged in the garden but nevertheless he was well aware of everything that passed and of how that the duke of northumber rode up and down so proudly before the castle walls so of a sudden it came to him that he could not abide this any longer wherefore he laid aside his spade and went out secretly by a postern way and so up into the town now there was in cameliard an exceedingly rich merchant by name ralph of cardiff and the renown of his possessions and his high estate had reached even unto king arthur's ears at carleon accordingly it was unto his house that king arthur directed his steps and while he was in a narrow way not far from the merchant's house he took off his magic cap of disguise and assumed somewhat of his noble appearance once more for he was now of a mind to show his knightliness unto those who looked upon him accordingly when he stood before the rich merchant in his closet and when the merchant looked up into his face he wist not what to think to behold so noble a lord clad all in frieze for though king arthur was a stranger to the good man so that he knew not his countenance yet that merchant wist that he was no ordinary knight but that he must assuredly be one of high degree and in authority even though he was clad in frieze then king arthur opened the breast of his jerkin and showed the merchant the gold collar that hung around his neck and also he showed beneath the rough coat of frieze how that there was an undergarment of fine purple silk embroidered with gold and when he showed to the good man his own signet ring and when the merchant saw it he knew it to be the ring of the king of britain wherefore beholding these tokens of high and lordly authority the merchant arose and stood before the king and doffed his cap sir merchant quoth the king know that i am a stranger knight in disguise in this place nevertheless i may tell thee that i am a very good friend to king leodegrance and wish him exceedingly well thou art surely aware of how the duke of northumber rides continually up and down before the king's castle and challenges any one within to come forth for to fight against him in behalf of the lady guinevere now i am of a mind to assay that combat mine own self and I hope a very great deal that I shall succeed in upholding the honour of Cameliard, and of bringing shame upon its enemies. Sir Merchant, I know very well that thou hast several suits of noble armour in thy treasury, for the fame of them hath reached unto mine ears, though I dwell a considerable distance from this place. Wherefore I desire that thou shalt provide me in the best manner that thou art able to do, so that I may straightway assay a bout of arms with that Duke of Northumber. Moreover, I do pledge thee my knightly word, that thou shalt be fully recompensed for the best suit of armour that thou canst let me have, and that in a very little while. My lord, said Master Ralph, I perceive that thou art no ordinary errant knight, but rather someone of extraordinary estate. 
wherefore it is a very great pleasure to fulfil all thy behests. But even an thou wert other than thou art, I would be altogether willing to equip thee with armour, seeing that thou hast a mind to ride forth against yonder duke. Upon this he rang a little silver bell that stood nigh to him, and in answer to its sound several attendants immediately appeared. Into their hands he entrusted the person of the king, bidding them to do him extraordinary honour. Accordingly, certain of those attendants prepared for the king a bath of tepid water perfumed with ambergris, very grateful to the person. And after he was bathed in this bath and was wiped with soft linen towels, other attendants conducted him to a hall all hung with tapestries and broideries, and at this place a noble feast had been spread ready for his refreshment. Here that lordly merchant himself ministered to the king's wants, serving him with various meats, very dainty and of several sorts, and likewise with fine white bread. And he poured him wine of various countries, some as red as ruby, others as yellow as gold. And indeed the king had hardly ever enjoyed a better feast than that which the merchant Ralph of Cardiff had thus spread for him. And after he had entirely refreshed himself with eating, there came six pages, richly clad in sarsenet of azure, and these, taking the king to an apartment of great state, they there clad him in a suit of Spanish armour, very cunningly wrought, and all inlaid with gold. And the like of that armour was hardly to be found in all of the land. The chupon and the several trappings of the armour were all of satin and as white as milk. And the shield was white, and altogether without emblazonment or device of any sort. Then these attendants conducted the king into the courtyard, and there stood a noble war-horse, as white as milk, and all the trappings of the horse were of milk-white cloth without emblazonment or adornment of any sort, and the bridle and the bridle rein were all studded over with bosses of silver. Then, after the attendants had aided King Arthur to mount his steed, the lordly merchant came forward and gave him many words of good cheer, and so the king bade him adieu and rode away, all shining in white and glittering in fine armour, wherefore he resembled the full moon in harvest season. And as he drove down the stony streets of the town, the people turned and gazed after him, for he made a very noble appearance as he passed along the narrow way between the houses of the town. So King Arthur directed his way to the postern gate of the castle, and having reached that place he dismounted and tied his horse. Then he straightway entered the garden, and there, finding an attendant, he made demand that he should have present speech with the Lady Guinevere. So the attendant, all amazed at his lordly presence, went and delivered the message, and by and by the Lady Guinevere came, much wondering, and passed along a gallery with several of her damsels until she had come over above where King Arthur was. And when King Arthur looked up and saw her above him, he loved her exceeding well. And he said to her, Lady, I have great will to do thee such honour as I am able. For I go forth now to do combat with that Duke of Northumber who rides up and down before this castle. Moreover, I hope and verily believe that I shall encompass his downfall. Accordingly, I do beseech of thee some token, such as a lady may give unto a knight for to wear, when that knight rides forth to do her honour. Then the Lady Guinevere said, Certes, Sir Knight, I would that I knew who thou art, yet though I know not, nevertheless I am altogether willing for to take thee for my champion as thou offerest. So touching that token thou speakest of, if thou wilt tell me what thing it is that thou desirest, I will gladly give it to thee. And that be so, lady, said King Arthur, I would fain have that necklace that thou wearest about thy throat, for meseems that if I had that tied about my arm, I would find my valour greatly increased thereby. Pardy, sir knight, said the lady, what thou desirest of me thou shalt assuredly have. Thereupon speaking she took from her long, smooth neck the necklace of pearls which she wore, and dropped the same down to King Arthur where he stood. And King Arthur took the necklace and tied it about his arm, and he gave great thanks for it. Then he saluted the Lady Guinevere with very knightly grace, and she saluted him. And then straightway he went forth from that place, greatly expanded with joy that the Lady Guinevere had shown him such favour. Now the report had gone about Cameliard that a knight was to go forth to fight the Duke of Northumber. Wherefore great crowds gathered upon the walls, and King Leodegrance and the Lady Guinevere and all the court of the king came to that part of the castle walls overlooking the meadow where the Duke of Northumber defended. Wherefore so great a concourse was presently assembled, that any knight might be encouraged to do his utmost before such a multitude as that which looked down upon the field. 
Then of a sudden the portcullis of the castle was lifted, and the bridge let fall, and the white champion rode forth to that encounter which he had undertaken. And as he drave across that narrow bridge, the hoofs of his war-horse smote the boards with a noise like to thunder, and when he came out into the sunlight, lo, his armor flamed of a sudden like unto lightning, and when the people saw him, they shouted aloud. Then when the Duke of Northumber beheld a knight all clad in white, he rode straightway to him and spoke to him with words of knightly greeting. Messiah, he said, I perceive that thou bearest no crest upon thy helm, nor hast thou a device of any sort upon thy shield, wherefore I know not who thou art. Nevertheless, I do believe that thou art a knight of good quality and of approved courage, or else thou wouldst not have thus come to this place. Certes, Sir Knight, said King Arthur, I am of a quality equal to thine own. And as for my courage, I do believe that it hath been approved in as many encounters as even thine own hath been. Sir Knight, quoth the Duke of Umber, thou speakest with a very large spirit. Nevertheless, thou mayest make such prayers as thou art able, for I shall now presently so cast thee down from thy seat, so that thou shalt never rise again. For so have I served better men than ever thou mayest hope to be. To this King Arthur made answer with great calmness of demeanour, That shall be according to the will of heaven, Sir Knight, and not according to thy will. So each knight saluted the other and rode to his assigned station, and there each dressed his spear and his shield, and made him ready for the encounter. Then a silence fell upon all so great that a man might hear his own heart beat in the stillness. So for a small space each knight sat like a statue made of iron. Then of a sudden each shouted to his war-horse, and drave spurs into his flank, and launched forth from his station. And so they met in the midst of the course with a noise like unto a violent thunder-clap, and lo, the spear of the Duke of Northumber burst into splinters unto the very truncheon thereof. But the spear of King Arthur broke not, but held, so that the Duke was cast out of his saddle like a windmill, whirling in the air and smiting the earth so that the ground shuddered beneath him and indeed he rolled full three times over and over ere he ceased to fall then all the people upon the wall shouted with might and main so that the noise thereof was altogether astonishing for they had hardly hoped that their champion should have proved so extraordinarily strong and skilful Meanwhile, those of King Ryans's court ran immediately to the Duke of Umber, where he lay upon the earth, and they straightway unlaced his helm for to give him air. And first they thought that he was dead, and then they thought that he was like to die. For behold, he lay without any life or motion. Nor did he recover from that swoon wherein he lay for the space of full two hours and more. Now whilst the attendants were thus busied about Duke Mordaunt of North Umber, King Arthur sat his horse very quietly, observing all that they did. Then, perceiving that his enemy was not dead, he turned him about and rode away from that place. Nor did he return unto Cameliard at that time, for he deemed that he had not yet entirely done with these enemies to the peace of his realm. Wherefore he was minded not yet to return the horse and the armour to the merchant, but to keep them for a while for another occasion. So he bethought him of how, coming to Cameliard, he had passed through an arm of the forest, where certain wood-choppers were at work felling the trees. Wherefore, remembering that place, he thought that he would betake him thither, and leave his horse and armour in the care of those rude folk, until he would need those things once more. So now he rode away into the countryside, leaving behind him the town and the castle, and all the noise of shouting and rejoicing, nor did he once so much as turn his head to look back toward that place where he had so violently overthrown his enemy. And now you shall presently hear of certain pleasant adventures of a very joyous sort that befell him ere he had accomplished all his purposes. For when a man is a king among men, as was King Arthur, then is he of such a calm and equal temper that neither victory nor defeat may cause him to become either unduly exalted in his own opinion, or so troubled in spirit as to be altogether cast down into despair. So if you would become like to King Arthur, then you shall take all your triumphs, as he took this victory. For you will not be turned aside from your final purposes by the great applause that many men may give you, but you will first finish your work that you have set yourself to perform, ere you give yourself ease to sit you down and to enjoy the fruits of your victory. Yea, he who is a true king of men will not say to himself, Lo, I am worthy to be crowned with laurels, but rather will he say to himself, What more is there that I may do to make the world the better because of my endeavours? End of section 14
Section 15 of The Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3. The Winning of a Queen, Chapter 3rd. How King Arthur encountered four knights, and of what befell thereby. Now the day was extraordinarily sweet and pleasant unto one so lusty of frame and so lithe of heart as was good King Arthur. For the bright clouds swam smoothly across the blue sky in prodigious volumes of vapour, and the wind blew across the long grass of the meadowlands, and across the fields of growing wheat, so that a multitude of waves travelled over the hills and valleys, like an it were across an entire sea of green. And now all the earth would be darkened with wide shadows from those clouds, and, anon, everything would burst out of a sudden into a wonderful radiance of sunlight once more. And the little birds they sang all gaily in the hedgerows and the leafy thickets, as though they would burst their tiny throats with singing, and the cock crowed strong and lusty from the farm croft, and all was so blithe and comely that the young king, with the visor of his helmet uplifted to the freshment of the gentle breeze, would sometimes carol very joyously in his journeying. So travelled King Arthur in all that gay and tender summer season, when the earth was young and the time was of long gone by. Now you are to remember that when King Arthur had come from Carleon unto the castle of Tintagalon, he had brought with him four young knights for to bear him company, and those knights aforesaid were as follows. There was Sir Gawain, the son of King Lot and of Queen Margase, and there was Sir Ewan, the son of King Uriens and of Queen Morgana la Fay, and these two were nephews, half in blood unto the king. And there was Sir Pelias, and there was Sir Geraint, the son of Urban. These were the four noble young knights who had come with King Arthur from Camelot unto Tintagalon. Now it befell, as King Arthur rode all gaily in the summer-time, as aforesaid, that he came to a certain part of the road where he beheld before him a tall and comely tower that stood upon a green hillock immediately by the roadside. And, lo, there stood upon the balcony of that tower three fair demoiselles, clad all in green taffeta. And on the high road in front of the castle there was a knight clad all in very fine armour. And the knight sat upon a noble war-horse, and in his hands he held a lute, and he played upon the lute, and sang in a voice of extraordinary sweetness. Whilst he sang, those three ladies in green taffeta listened to him with great cheerfulness of mien. And whenever that knight would stint his singing, then those three ladies would clap their hands together with great acclaim, and would bid him to sing to them again and so he would do, with great readiness of spirit. All this King Arthur beheld, and it appeared to him to be a very pleasant sight, wherefore he rejoiced at it exceedingly. And as he drew nigh, lo, he beheld that the knight who thus sat upon his horse, and played upon the lute, and sang unto the accompaniment thereof, was none other than Sir Geraint, the son of Urban. For that knight wore upon his crest the figure of a griffin, and the device upon his shield was two griffins rampant, facing one another upon a field azure, and King Arthur knew that this was the crest and the device of Sir Geraint. And when the king perceived who was the knight who sat there and sang, he laughed unto himself, and straightway closed his visor, and made him ready for such encounter as might perchance befall. So he drew nigh to where the knight sang, and the ladies listened. Now when Sir Geraint perceived King Arthur approach, he ceased singing, and hung up his lute behind him across his shoulder. Then, casting upward his look to those three fair ladies above him, quoth he, Madams, ye have been pleased to listen to that singing which I have essayed to altogether in your honour. Now, likewise in your honour, I will perform a deed of knightly prowess, which I very much hope shall bring great glory to you. For, if you will be pleased to lend me that encouragement which your very great beauty can so easily afford, Ye shall behold me, I doubt not, overthrow yonder knight completely, and that to your great credit and renown. Sir knight, said that lady, who spoke for the others, you are truly a lord of noble bearing, and exceedingly pleasing of address, 
Wherefore we do wish you great success in this undertaking, and we do believe that you will succeed in that which you assay to do. Upon these Sir Geraint gave those three demoiselles great thanks for their words, and thereupon he closed the visor of his helmet. So, dressing his spear and shield, and saluting those three ladies with great humility of demeanour, he went forth to meet King Arthur, where he now sat at a little distance, very quietly and soberly awaiting his pleasure. Now Sir Geraint knew not King Arthur, because he wore no crest upon his helm, and no device upon his shield. Wherefore, as he saluted him, he made speech to him in this wise, Ha! Messiah, I know not who thou art, seeing that thou bearest neither crest nor device. Nevertheless, I am minded to do thee such honour as I may in running a tilt with thee upon the behalf of those three demoiselles, whom thou beholdest yonder upon that balcony. For I do affirm, and am ready to maintain the same with my knightly person, that those ladies are fairer than thy lady, whomsoever she may be. Sir Knight, quoth King Arthur, I will gladly run a course with thee in honour of my lady. For, I may tell thee, she is a princess, and is held by many to be the most beautiful dame in all of the world. But I will only contend with thee upon one condition, and the condition is this, that he who is overthrown shall yield himself as servant unto the other for seven days, and in that time he shall do all that may be required of him. I will accept thy gage, sir unknown knight, quoth Sir Geraint, and when I have overthrown thee, I will yield thee unto those fair ladies yonder for her to be their servant for seven days. And I do tell thee that there are a great many knights who would certainly regard that as being both a pleasant and an honourable task. And should I so chance as to overthrow thee, said King Arthur, I will send thee for to serve my lady for that same period of time, and that will be even a pleasanter and a more honourable task than that which thou hast a mind for me to perform. So each knight saluted the other, and thereupon each took such a stand as should cast the encounter immediately beneath where those three fair demoiselles looked down from the balcony. Then each knight dressed his spear and his shield, and having made ready for the encounter, each sat for a small space entirely prepared. Then each shouted to his war-horse, and drave spur into its flank, and launched forth with wonderful speed to the assault. So they met in the very midst of the course with a force so vehement that the noise thereof was wonderfully appalling for to hear. And each knight smote the other in the very centre of his defences, and lo, the spear of Sir Geraint burst into small pieces, even to the truncheon thereof. But the spear of King Arthur held, and Sir Geraint was cast so violently backward that both he and his horse were overthrown into the dust, with a tumult like to a monstrous roaring of thunder. And when Sir Geraint had recovered his footing, he was for a while so astonished, that he wist not where he stood, for never had he been so overthrown in all of his life before. Then, coming quickly unto himself again, he straightway drew forth his sword, and called upon King Arthur with exceeding vehemence for to come down from out of his saddle and to fight him afoot. "'Nay, not so, Sir Knight,' said King Arthur. "'I will not have to do with thee in that way. Moreover, thou art not to forget that thou hast promised to give thyself unto me as my servant for seven days, for assuredly I have entirely overcome thee in this encounter, and now thou art pledged unto me to be my servant.' Then Sir Geraint knew not what to say, being altogether abashed with shame and vexation at his overthrow. Nevertheless he perceived that he must uphold his knightly word unto that which he had pledged himself to do. Wherefore he put up his sword again, though with exceeding discontent. "'Sir Knight,' said he, "'I do acknowledge myself to have been overcome in this encounter. Wherefore I yield myself now unto thy commands, according to my plighted word.' Then I do place my commands upon thee in this wise, quoth King Arthur. My command is that thou go straightway unto the Lady Guinevere at Cameliard, and that thou tellest her that thou hast been overthrown by that knight to whom she gave her necklace as a token. Moreover, I do desire that thou shalt obey her in everything that she may command thee to do, and that for the space of seven days to come. Sir Knight, quoth Sir Geraint, that which thou biddest me to do, I will perform according to thy commands. Thereupon he mounted his horse and went his way, and King Arthur went his way, and those three ladies who stood upon the balcony of the castle were exceedingly glad that they had beheld so noble an assay at arms as that which they had looked down upon. 
Now, after King Arthur had travelled forward for the distance of two or three leagues or more, he came to a certain place of moorlands, where were many ditches of water, and where the heron and the marsh hen sought harbourage in the sedge. And here at sundry points were several windmills, with their sails all turning slowly in the sunlight before a wind which blew across the level plains of ooze. And at this place there was a long straight causeway, with two long rows of pollard willows, one upon either hand. Now when he had come nigh the middle of this causeway, King Arthur perceived two knights, who sat their horses in the shade of a great windmill that stood upon one side of the roadway. And a large shadow of the sails moved ever and anon across the roadway as the wheel of the mill turned slowly afore the wind. And all about the mill and everywhere about were great quantities of swallows that darted hither and thither like bees about a hive in midsummer. And King Arthur saw that those two knights, as they sat in the shadow of the mill, were eating of a great loaf of rye bread, fresh baked and of brittle crust, and they ate fair white cheese, which things the miller, all white with dust, served to them. But when these two knights perceived King Arthur, they immediately ceased eating that bread and cheese, and straightway closed their helmets. As for the miller, when he saw them thus prepare themselves, he went quickly back into the mill, and shut the door thereof, and then went and looked out of a window which was over above where the knights were standing. But King Arthur made very merry unto himself, when he perceived that those two knights were Sir Gawain and Sir Ewan. For he knew that the one was Sir Gawain, because that the crest of his helmet was a leopard rampant, and because he bore upon his shield the device of a leopard rampant upon a field gules. And he knew that the other was Sir Ewan, because he bore upon his crest a unicorn, and because the device upon his shield was that of a lady holding a naked sword in her hand, which same was upon a field oar. Accordingly, whilst he was yet at some distance, King Arthur closed his helmet, so that those two young knights might not know who he was. So when he had come anear to the two knights, Sir Gawain rode forward for a little distance for to meet him. Sir Knight, quoth he, thou must know that this is soothly parlous ground whereon thou hast ventured, for there is no byway hence across the morass, and thou mayst not go forward without trying a tilt with me. Sir Knight, said King Arthur, and I am very willing to run a tilt with thee. Nevertheless, I will only encounter thee upon one condition, and that is this, that he who is overthrown shall serve the other entirely for the space of seven full days. I do accept thy gage, Sir Knight, quoth Sir Gawain, for he said unto himself, Of a surety, so exceedingly strong and skilful a knight as I shall easily encompass the overthrow of this unknown knight. So each knight immediately took his appointed station, and, having dressed his spear and his shield, and having fully prepared himself in every manner, and having rested for a little space, each suddenly shouted to his horse, and drave spur into the flanks thereof, and so rushed to the encounter. And each knight smote the other in the midst of his defence, and, lo, the spear of Sir Gawain burst into fragments. But the spear of King Arthur held, so that Sir Gawain was lifted entirely out of his saddle and over the crupper of his horse, and indeed he fell with wonderful violence into the dust. Nor could he immediately rise from that fall, but lay all bedazed for a little while, and when he did arise he perceived that the white knight who had overthrown him sat nigh to him upon his horse. Then King Arthur spake and said, Sir Knight, I have altogether overthrown thee, and so thou must now serve me according to thy knightly word. Then up spake Sir Ewan, who sat near by upon his horse. Not so, Sir Knight, he said, not so, nor until thou hast had to do with me. For I do make demand of thee that thou shalt straightway joust with me, and if I overthrow thee I will claim of thee that thou shalt release my cousin from that servitude unto which he hath pledged himself. But if thou overthrowest me, then will I serve thee even as he hath pledged himself to serve thee. Sir Knight, said King Arthur, I do accept thy gage with all readiness of spirit. So each knight took his assigned place, and dressed himself for the encounter. Then they shouted and drave together, rushing the one upon the other like unto two rams upon the hillside. And the spear of Sir Ewan was also shivered into pieces. But King Arthur's spear held, so that the girths of Sir Ewan's saddle were burst apart, 
and both the saddle and the knight were swept off the horse's back with such violence that a tower falling could not have made a greater noise than did Sir Ewan when he smote the dust of that causeway. Then Sir Ewan arose to his feet and gazed upon him all filled with entire amazement. To him came King Arthur, and bespake him thus, Ha, ah, Sir Knight, meseems that thou hast been fairly overcome this day, and so, according to your promises, both thou and yonder other knight must fulfill all my commands for the space of full seven days to come. Now this is the command that I set upon ye both that ye shall straightway go unto the Lady Guinevere at Cameliard, and shall take her greeting from her knight, and ye shall say to her that her knight unto whom she gave her necklace hath sent ye who are king's sons for to do obedience unto her. And all that she shall command ye to do in the space of these seven days that are to come, that shall ye perform even unto the smallest grain. Sir Knight, said Sir Gawain, so we will do according to thy commands, having pledged ourselves thereunto. But when these seven days are past, I do make my vow, that I shall seek thee out, and shall carry this combat unto its entire extremity. For it may happen to any knight to be unhorsed as I have been, yet I do believe that I may have a better success with thee, and I battle with thee to the extremity of my endeavour. Sir knight, said King Arthur, it shall be even as thou desirest, Yet I do verily believe that when these seven days are past, thou wilt not have such great desire for to fight with me as thou now hast. Having so spoken, King Arthur saluted those two knights, and they saluted him. And then he turned his horse and went his way. And whenever he bethought him of how those two good knights had fallen before his assault, and when he thought of how astonished and abashed they had been at their overthrow, he laughed aloud for pure mirth, and vowed unto himself that he had never in all of his life engaged in so joyous an adventure as this. So when Sir Ewan had mended the girths of his saddle, then he and Sir Gawain mounted their horses, and betook their way toward Cameliard, much cast down in spirits. Then the miller came forth from the mill once more, greatly rejoiced at having beheld such a wonderfully knightly encounter from so safe a place as that from which he had beheld it. And so King Arthur rode onward with great content of mind, until the slanting of the afternoon had come, and by that time he had come nigh to that arm of the forest land which he had in mind as the proper place where he might leave his horse and his armor. Now as he drew nigh to this part of the forest skirts, he perceived before him at the roadside a gnarled and stunted oak tree, and he perceived that upon the oak tree there hung a shield and that underneath the shield were written these words in fair large letters. Whoso smiteth upon this shield doeth so at the peril of his body. Then King Arthur was filled with a great spirit, and uplifting his spear he smote upon that shield so that it rang like thunder. Then immediately King Arthur heard a voice issue out of the forest crying, Who hath dared to assail my shield? And straightway there came out thence a knight of large frame, riding upon a horse white like that which King Arthur himself rode. And the trappings of the horse and of the knight were all white like unto the trappings of King Arthur and his horse. And the knight bore upon his helmet as his crest a swan with outspread wings, and upon his shield he bore the emblazonment of three swans upon a field argent. And because of the crest and the emblazonment of the shield, King Arthur knew that this knight was Sir Pelias who had come with him from Camelot to Tintagalon. So when Sir Pelias had come nigh to where King Arthur waited for him, he drew rein and bespake him with great sternness of voice. Ho, ho, Sir Knight, quoted he, why didst thou dare to smite upon my shield? Verily that blow shall bring thee great peril and dole. Now prepare to defend thyself straightway because of what thou hast done. Stay, stay, Sir Knight, said King Arthur, it shall be as thou wouldst have it, and I will do combat with thee. Yet will I not assay this adventure until thou hast agreed that the knight who is overcome in the encounter shall serve the other in whatsoever manner that other may desire for the space of one senite from this time. Sir Knight, said Sir Pelias, I do accept that risk, wherefore I bid thee now presently to prepare thyself for the encounter. Thereupon each knight took his station, and dressed his spear and shield, 
and when they had prepared themselves they immediately launched together with a violence like to two stones cast from a catapult so they met in the midst of the course and again king arthur was entirely successful in that assault which he made for the spear of sir pelias burst to pieces and the spear of king arthur held and sir pelias was cast with passing violence out of his saddle for the distance of more than half a spear's length behind the crupper of his horse nor did he altogether recover from that fall for a long time so that king arthur had to wait beside him for a considerable while ere he was able to lift himself up from the ground whereon he lay ha sir knight said king arthur assuredly it hath not gone well with thee this day for thou hast been entirely overthrown and now thou must straightway redeem thy pledge to serve me for seven days hereafter wherefore i now set it upon thee as my command that thou shalt go straightway unto cameliard and that thou shalt greet the lady guinevere from me telling her that her knight unto whom she gave her necklace hath been successful in battle with thee likewise i set it upon thee that thou shalt obey her for the space of seven days in whatsoever she may command thee to do sir knight said sir pelias it shall even be as thou dost ordain yet i would that i knew who thou art for i do declare that i have never yet in all my life been overthrown as thou hast overthrown me and indeed i think that there are very few men in the world who could serve me as thou hast served me sir knight said king arthur some time thou shalt know who i am but as yet i am bound to entire secrecy thereupon he saluted sir pelias and turned and entered the forest and was gone and sir pelias mounted his horse and betook him to cameliard much cast down and disturbed in spirit yet much marvelling who that knight could be who had served him as he had been served so that day there came to cameliard first sir geraint and then sir gawain and sir ewan and last of all there came sir pelias and when these four beheld one another they were all abashed so that one scarce dared to look the other in the face and when they came before the lady guinevere and made their condition known to her and told her how that knight who wore her necklace had overthrown them all and had sent them thither to serve her for a senite and when she reckoned how great and famous were those four knights in deeds of chivalry she was exceedingly exalted that her knight should have approved himself so great in those deeds of arms which he had undertaken to perform but she greatly marvelled who that champion could be and debated those things in her own mind for it was a thing altogether unheard of that one knight in one day and with a single spear should have overthrown five such well-proved and famous knights as duke mordaunt of north umber sir geraint sir gawain sir ewan and sir pelias so she gave herself great joy that she had bestowed the gift of her necklace upon so worthy a knight and she was exceedingly uplifted with extraordinary pleasure at the thought of the credit he had endowed her withal now after king arthur had entered the forest he came by and by to where those wood-choppers afore spoken of plied their craft and he abided with them for that night and when the next morning had come he entrusted them with his horse and armour charging them to guard those things with all care and that they should be wonderfully rewarded therefor then he took his departure from that place with intent to return unto cameliard and he was clad in that jerkin of frieze which he had worn ever since he had left tintagalon and when he had reached the outskirts of the forest he set his cap of disguise upon his head and so resumed his mean appearance once more so his knightliness being entirely hidden he returned to cameliard for to be gardener's boy as he had been before end of section fifteen Section 16 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3 The Winning of a Queen. Chapter Fourth, Part One. How the four knights served the Lady Guinevere. Now, when King Arthur returned to Cameliard once more, which fell upon the afternoon of a second day, he found the gardener waiting for him, exceedingly filled with wrath. 
and the gardener had a long birchen rod which he had fetched thither for to punish his boy withal when that he should have returned to the garden again so when he saw king arthur he said thou knave wherefore didst thou quit thy work to go a gadding and king arthur laughed and said touch me not at this the gardener waxed so exceeding wroth that he catched the king by the collar of his jerkin with intent to beat him saying dost thou laugh at me knave and make a mock at me now i will beat thee well for the offence thou hast committed then when king arthur felt that man's hand laid upon him and when he heard the words the gardener spake in his wrath his royal spirit waxed very big within him and he cried out ha wretch wouldst thou dare to lay thy hands upon my sacred person so saying he seized the gardener by the wrists and took the rod straight away from him and struck him with it across the shoulders and when that poor knave felt himself thus in the powerful grasp of the angry king and when he felt the rod upon his shoulders he straightway lifted up a great outcry albeit the blow hurt him not a whit now get thee gone quoth king arthur and trouble me no more else will i serve thee in a way that will not at all be like thee herewith he loosed that poor man and let him go but the gardener was so bemazed with terror that both the earth and the sky swam before him for king arthur's eyes had flashed upon him like lightning and those two hands had held his wrists with wonderful power wherefore when the king let him go he gat him away as quickly as might be all trembling and sweating with a great fear so he went straight to the lady guinevere and complained to her of the manner in which he had been treated lady quoth he weeping with the memory of his terror my boy goeth away for a day or more i know not whither and when i would whip him for quitting his work he taketh the rod straight away from me and beateth me with it wherefore now i prithee deal with him as is fitting and let several strong men drive him away from this place with rods then the lady guinevere laughed let be she said and meddle with him no more for indeed he appeareth to be a very saucy fellow as for thee take thou no heed of his coming or his going and haply i will deal with him in such a way as shall be fitting whereupon the gardener went his way greatly marvelling that the lady guinevere should be so mild in dealing with that torrid knave and the lady guinevere went her way very merry for she began to bethink her that there was soothly some excellent reason why it should happen that when the white champion who did such wonderful deeds should come thither then that gardener's boy should go and that when that same champion should go then the gardener's boy should come thitherward again wherefore she suspected many things and was wonderfully merry and cheerful of spirit now that day in the afternoon the lady guinevere chanced to walk in the garden with her damsels and with her walked those four noble knights who had been sent thither by her white champion to wit sir gawain sir ewan sir geraint and sir pelias and the gardener's lad was digging in the gardens and as they passed by where he was the lady guinevere laughed aloud and cried out look look messires and ladies yonder is a very saucy fellow for to be gardener's lad for he continually weareth his cap even when he standeth in the presence of lords and ladies then sir gawain up and spake saying is it even so now will i straightway go to yonder knave and will take his hat off for him and that in a way so greatly to his misliking that i do not believe that he will ever offend by wearing it in our presence again at this the lady guinevere laughed a very great deal let be she said let be sir gawain it would ill beseem one so gentle as thou art to have to do with yonder saucy fellow moreover he doth assure us all that he hath an ugly place upon his head wherefore let him wear his cap in god's mercy thus the lady guinevere though she suspected a very great deal was yet pleased to make a mock of him whom she suspected now that day duke mordaunt of north umber had entirely recovered from those sore hurts that he had suffered from his overthrow at the hands of the white champion wherefore the next morning having come he appeared again before the castle as he had appeared aforetime clad all in complete armour so this time there rode before him two heralds and when the duke and the two heralds had come to that part of the meadows that lay immediately before the castle of cameliard the heralds blew their trumpets exceedingly loud so at the sound of the trumpets many people came and gathered upon the walls and king leodegrance came and took stand upon a lesser tower that looked down upon the plain where were the duke of north umber and the two heralds then the duke of north umber lifted up his eyes and beheld king leodegrance where he stood over above him upon the top of that tower and he cried out in a loud voice what ho king leodegrance thou shalt not think because i suffered a fall from my horse through the mischance of an assault at arms that thou art therefore quit of me 
yet nevertheless i do now make this fair proffer unto thee to-morrow day i shall appear before this castle with six knights companion now if thou hast any seven knights who are able to stand against me and my companions in an assault at arms whether with spears or swords or a horse or a foot then shall i engage myself for to give over all pretence whatsoever unto the hand of the lady guinevere but if thou canst not provide such champions to contend successfully against me and my knight's companion then shall i not only lay claim to lady guinevere but i shall likewise seize upon and shall hold for mine own three certain castles of thine that stand upon the borders of north umber and likewise i shall seize upon and shall hold for mine own all the lands and glebes appertaining unto those same castles moreover this challenge of mine shall hold only until to-morrow at set of sun after the which time it shall be null and void wherefore king leodegrance thou hast best look to it straightway to provide thee with such champions as may defend thee from these demands aforesaid hereupon those two heralds blew their trumpets once more and duke mordaunt of north umber turned his horse about and went away from that place then king leodegrance also went his way very sorrowful and downcast in his spirits for he said to himself is it at all likely that another champion shall come unto me like that wonderful white champion who came two days since i know not whence for to defend me against mine enemies and touching that same white champion if i know not whence he came so also i know not whither he hath departed how then shall i know where to seek him to beseech his further aid in this time of mine extremity wherefore he went his way very sorrowful and wist not what he was to do for to defend himself so being thus exceedingly troubled in his spirit he went straight unto his own room and there shut himself therein nor would he see any man nor speak unto any one but gave himself over entirely unto sorrow and despair now in this extremity the lady guinevere bethought her of those four knights who had been pledged for to serve her for seven days so she went unto them where they were and she bespoke them in this wise messires you have been sent hither pledged for to serve me for seven days now i do ordain it of thee that you will take this challenge of duke mordaunt upon you at my behest and i do much desire that you go forth to-morrow day for to meet this duke of north umber and his knight's companion in battle for ye are terribly powerful knights and i do believe you may easily defend us against our enemies but sir gawain said not so lady not so for though we are pledged unto thy service yet are we not pledged unto the service of king leodegrance thy father nor have we quarrel of any sort with this duke of north umber nor with his six knights companion for we are knights of king arthur his court nor may we except at his command take any foreign quarrel upon us in the service of another king then was the lady guinevere exceedingly angry wherefore she said with great heat either thou art a wonderfully faithful lord unto thy king sir gawain or else thou fearest to meet this duke of north umber and his knights companion and at this speech of the lady guinevere's sir gawain was also exceedingly wroth wherefore he made reply and thou wert a knight and not a lady dame guinevere thou wouldst think three or four times ere thou wouldst find courage to speak those words unto me whereupon he arose and went out from that place with a countenance all inflamed with wrath and the lady guinevere went away also from that place unto her bower where she wept a very great deal both from sorrow and from anger now all this while king arthur had been very well aware of everything that passed wherefore he by and by arose and went out and found the gardener and he took the gardener strongly by the collar of his coat and held him where he was and he said to him sirrah i have a command to set upon thee and thou shalt perform that command to the letter else an thou perform it not a very great deal of pain may befall thee herewith speaking he thrust his hand into the bosom of his jerkin and brought forth thence that necklace of pearls which the lady guinevere had given him from about her neck and he said further unto the gardener thou shalt take this necklace to the lady guinevere and thou shalt say to her thus that she is to send me forthwith bread and meat and wine and comfits from her own table and thou shalt say unto her that i desire her to summon those four knights to wit sir gawain sir erwin sir geraint and sir pelias and that she is to bid those four for to come and serve me with those things for my refreshment and thou art to say unto her that she is to lay her commands upon those knights that they are further to serve me according as i may command and that they are henceforth to be my servants and not her servants and these are the commands that i lay upon thee that thou art to say these things unto the lady guinevere 
Now when the gardener heard those words, he was so astonished that he was not what to think, for he deemed that the gardener's lad had gone altogether mad. Wherefore he lifted up his voice and cried aloud, How now? What is this thou sayest? Verily should I do such a thing as this thou bidst me to do, either it will cost me my life, or else it will cost thee thy life. For who would dare for to say such words unto the Lady Guinevere? But King Arthur said, Nevertheless thou shalt surely do as I command thee, Sirrah, for if thou disobey in one single point, then I do assure thee it will go exceedingly ill with thee, for I have it in my power for to make thee suffer as thou hast never suffered before. And upon this the gardener said, I will go, for he said unto himself, If I do as this fellow biddeth me, then will the Lady Guinevere have him punished in great measure, and so I shall be revenged upon him for what he did unto me yesterday. Moreover, it irks me exceedingly that I should have a lad for to work in the garden who behaves as this fellow does. Wherefore, he said, I will go. So he took that necklace of pearls that King Arthur gave him, and he went forth, and after a while he found the Lady Guinevere where she was. And when he had found her, he bespoke her in this wise. Lady, my garden boy hath assuredly gone entirely mad. For under the threat of certain great harm he would do unto me, and I perform not his errand, he hath sent me to offer a very grievous affront unto thee, for he hath sent me with his string of large beads for to give to thee, and he bids me to tell thee that thou art to send to him bread and meat and sweetmeats and wine, such as thou usest at thine own table. And he bids me to tell thee that these things are to be served to him by the four noble knights who came hither the day before yesterday. And he saith that thou art to command those same knights that they are to obey him in whatsoever he may command, for that they are henceforth to be his servants and not thine. And indeed, lady, he would listen to naught that I might say to him contrariwise, but he hath threatened me with dire injury, and I came not hither and delivered this message unto thee. End of section 16 Section 17 of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur, Part 3. The Winning of a Queen. Chapter 4, Part 2. Now, when the Lady Guinevere heard what the gardener said, and when she beheld the necklace which she had given unto that white champion, and when she wist that the white champion and the gardener's boy were indeed one, she was uplifted with an exceeding joy, wherefore she knew not whether to laugh or whether to weep for that pure joy. So she arose and took the necklace of pearls, and she bade the gardener for to come with her. Then she went forth until she found those four knights, and when she had found them she spake unto them thus, My lords, a while sin when I commanded you for to take my quarrel with Duke Mordaunt of North Umber upon you for my sake, you would not do so. And thou, my lord Gowan, didst speak such angry words as are not fitting that one who serveth should speak unto his mistress, far less that a knight should speak unto the daughter of a king. Accordingly I have it in my mind that ye shall perform a certain thing by way of a penance, which an ye refuse to do. I will know very well that ye do not intend to fulfil that word which ye plighted to my knight when he overthrew you all four in fair combat. Now my command is this, that he take certain food prepared for my table, meats and white bread and sweetmeats and wine, and that he take that food unto my gardener's boy, whose cap, Sir Gowan, thou didst threaten so valorously for to take away from him this very morning. And ye four are to serve the food unto him as though he were a royal knight, and when ye have so served him, ye are to obey him in whatsoever he may ordain. And this I put upon ye as a penalty, because ye took not my quarrel upon ye as true knights should. For hereafter ye are to be servants unto that gardener's boy, and not unto me. Wherefore ye are now to go into the buttery of the castle, and ye are to bid the sewer for to give you meat such as are served upon mine own table. And the food ye are to serve upon silver plates, and the wine ye are to serve in silver cups and goblets. And ye are to minister unto that gardener's boy as though he were a great lord of exceeding fame and renown. Thus spake the Lady Guinevere, and when she had spoken she turned and left those four knights, and she took with her the gardener, who was so astonished at that which he had heard that he wist not whether he had gone mad, or whether the Lady Guinevere had gone mad. 
and the Lady Guinevere bade the gardener to go to the gardener's boy, and to tell him that all things should be fulfilled according to his commands. And so the gardener did as he was told. Now turn we to those four knights whom the Lady Guinevere had left, for they were amazed and abashed at the singular commands she had set upon them. And when they recovered from their amazement, they were inflamed with exceeding indignation, that for the time they wist not whether that which they saw with their eyes was the light of day, or whether it was altogether darkness. Nor could one of them look at another in the face, so overcome were they with shame at the affront that had been put upon them. Then up and spake Sir Gawain, and his voice so trembled with his exceeding anger that he could scarce contain it for to speak his words. Messires, quoth he, do ye not see how that this lady hath wantonly put a great affront upon us, because we would not do that which she this morning bade us to do, and because we would not take up her quarrel against the Duke of Northumber? Now we will indeed serve this gardener's boy, even as she hath ordained. For we will serve him with meat and drink, as she hath commanded, and we will render our service unto him, as she hath bidden us to do. But observe ye, we are no longer her servants, but we are his servants. Wherefore we may serve him, as we choose for to do. So when we have fulfilled her commands, and have served him with meat and drink, and when we have obeyed all the behests he layeth upon us, then do I make my vow that I with mine own hand shall slay that gardener's boy. And when I have slain him, I will put his head into a bag, and I will send that bag unto the Lady Guinevere by the meanest carrier whom I can find for that purpose. And so this proud lady shall receive an affront as great as that affront which she hath put upon us. And they all said that that which Sir Gawain had planned should be exactly as he had said. So those four lords went unto the sewer of the castle, and they asked for the best of that food which was to be served unto the Lady Guinevere, meats and bread and sweetmeats and wine. Then they took them silver plates and platters, and they placed the food upon them. And they took silver cups and silver goblets, and they poured the wine into them. And they went forth with these things. And when they had come back of the castle nigh to the stables, they found the gardener's boy, and they bade him sit down and eat and to drink. And they waited upon him as though he had been some great lord, and not one of those four knights wist who he was, nor that he was the great king whose servant they soothly were, for he wore his cap of disguise upon his head, wherefore they deemed him to be only a poor peasant fellow. Now when Sir Ewan beheld that he still wore his cap before them, he spake unto him with great indignation, saying, Ha, villain, wouldst thou wear thy cap even in the presence of great princes and lords such as we be? Unto this Sir Gawain said, Let be, it matters not. And then he said very bitterly unto the gardener's boy, Eat thou well, sirrah, for thou shalt hardly eat another meal of food upon this earth. To this the gardener's boy made reply, Sir knight, that haply shall lie unto another will than thine for to determine. For maybe I shall eat many other meals than this, and maybe ye shall serve at them as ye are serving me now. And those four lords were astonished beyond measure that he should bespeak them thus so calmly and without any appearance of fear. Then, after he had eaten, the gardener's boy said unto those knights, Behold, messires, I have had enough, and am done. And now I have other commands for you to fulfill. And my next command is that ye shall make ready straightway to go abroad with me, and to that end ye shall clothe yourselves with complete armour. And thou, Sir Gawain, shalt go to the head stable-keeper of this castle, and thou shalt demand of him that he shall make ready the Lady Guinevere's palfrey, so that I may straightway ride forth upon it. And when ye are all encased in your armour, and when everything is duly appointed according to my command, ye shall bring that palfrey unto the postern gate of the castle, and there I shall meet ye, for to ride forth with you. And Sir Gawain said, It shall be done in every way according as thou dost command. But when we ride forth from this castle, it shall be a sorry journey for thee." And the gardener's boy said, I think not so, Sir Gawain. Then those four went away and did according as the gardener's boy commanded. And when they had made themselves ready in full array of armour, and when they had obtained the Lady Guinevere's palfrey, they went unto the postern gate, and there the gardener's boy met them. And when he saw that they sat their horses, and that they moved not at his coming, he said, Ha, ah, messires, would ye so entreat him whom ye have been ordained to serve? Now I do bid ye, Sir Gawain and Sir Ewan, for to come down, and to hold my stirrup for me. And I bid ye, Sir Geraint and Sir Pelias, for to come down, 
and hold my palfrey for me whilst I mount. Then those four noble knights did as they were commanded. And Sir Gawain said, Thou mayest command as thou dost list, and I do bid thee to make the most of it whilst thou mayest do so, for thou shalt have but a little while longer for to enjoy the great honour that hath fallen upon thee. For that honour which hath fallen upon thee, lo, it shall presently crush thee unto death. And the gardener's boy said, Not so, I believe I shall not die yet whiles. And again those four lords were greatly astonished at the calmness of his demeanour. And so they rode forth from that place, and the gardener's boy would not permit that they should ride either before him or beside him, but he commanded them that they should ride behind him, whilst they were still servants unto him. So they rode as he assigned them for a considerable way. Then, after they had gone forward a great distance, they drew nigh to a gloomy and dismal woodland that lay entirely beyond the country co-adjacent to Cameliard. Then, when they had come nigh into this woodland, Sir Gawain rode a little forward and said, Sir Gardner's boy, seest thou yonder woodland? Now, when we come into it, thou shalt immediately die, and that by a sword that hath never yet been touched by any but noble or knightly blood. And King Arthur turned him about in his saddle, and he said, Ha, Sir Gawain, wouldst thou ride forward thus, when I bid thee to ride behind me? And as he spake, he took the cap from off his head, and, lo, they all beheld that it was King Arthur who rode with them. Then a great silence of pure astonishment fell upon them all, and each man sat as though he were turned into an image of stone. And it was King Arthur who first spake, and he said, Ha! how now, sir knights, have ye no words of greeting for to pay to me? Certes, ye have served me with a very ill grace this day. Moreover, ye have threatened to slay me, and now when I speak to you, ye say not in reply. Then those four knights immediately cried out aloud, and they leaped down from off their horses, and they kneeled down into the dust of the road. And when King Arthur beheld them kneeling there, he laughed with great joyfulness of spirit, and he bade them for to mount their horses again, for the time was passing by when there was much to do. So they mounted their horses and rode away, and as they journeyed forward, the king told them all that had befallen him so that they were greatly amazed, and gave much acclaim unto the knightliness with which he had borne himself in those excellent adventures through which he had passed. And they rejoiced greatly that they had a king for to rule over them, who was possessed of such a high and knightly spirit. So they rode to that arm of the forest where King Arthur had left his horse and his armour. End of section 17「Section 18 of the Story of King Arthur and His Knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle. The Book of King Arthur. Part 3. THE WINNING OF A QUEEN CHAPTER FIFTH PART ONE How King Arthur overcame the enemies of King Leodegrans, and how his royalty was proclaimed. Now, when the next day had come, the Duke of North Umber and six knights companion appeared upon the field in front of the castle of Cameliard, as he had duly declared that he and they would do. And those seven champions appeared in very great estate, for in front of them there rode seven heralds with trumpets and tabards, and behind them there rode seven esquires, each esquire bearing the spear, the shield, the crest, and the banneret of the knight who was his lord and master. And the seven heralds blew their trumpets so exceedingly loud that the sound thereof penetrated unto the utmost parts of Cameliard, so that the people came running from everywhere. And while the heralds blew their trumpets, the seven esquires shouted, and waved the spears and the bannerets. So those seven knights rode in such proud estate, that those who looked upon them had hardly ever beheld such a splendid presentment of chivalry. So they paraded up and down that field three times for its entire length, and, meantime, a great crowd of people, called thither by the blowing of the herald's trumpets, stood upon the walls and gazed therefrom at that noble spectacle. And all the court of King Rience came, and stood upon the plain in front of the king's pavilion, 
and they shouted and cheered the Duke of Northumber and his six knights' companion. Meanwhile, King Leodegrance of Cameliard was so cast down with trouble and shame that he did not choose to show his face, but hid himself away from all his court, nor would he permit any one for to come into his presence at that time. Nevertheless the Lady Guinevere, with sundry of her damsels, went unto the king's closet where he was, and knocked upon the door thereof, and when the king denied her to come in to him, she spake to him through the door, giving him words of good cheer, saying, My lord king and father, I prithee for to look up, and to take good cheer unto thyself. For I do assure thee that there is one who hath our cause in his hands, and that one is certes a very glorious champion, and he shall assuredly come by and by, ere this day is done, and when he cometh he shall certainly overthrow our enemies. But King Leodegrance opened not the door, but he said, My daughter, that which thou sayest, thou sayest for to comfort me. For there is no other help for me in this time of trouble, only God, his good strong help and grace. And she said, Nay, I say that which is the truth, and the help that God shall send unto thee, he shall certainly send through a worthy champion, who at this moment hath our cause in his hand. So spake the Lady Guinevere, so that whilst King Leodegrance came not forth, yet he was greatly comforted at that which she said to him. Thus passed all that morning and a part of the afternoon, and yet no one appeared for to take up that challenge which the seven knights had declared. But whilst the sun was yet three or four hours high, there suddenly appeared at a great distance a cloud of dust, and in that cloud of dust there presently appeared five knights riding at great speed thitherward. And when these had come nigh unto the walls, lo, the people beheld that he who rode foremost of all was that same white champion who had aforetime overthrown the Duke of Northumber. Moreover, they perceived that the four knights who rode with that white champion were very famous knights, and of great prowess and glory of arms. For the one was Sir Gawain, and the other was Sir Ewan, and the other was Sir Geraint, and the other was Sir Pelias. For the people of the castle and the town knew those four knights, because they had dwelt for two days at Cameliard, and they were of such exceeding renown that folk crowded from far and near, for to look upon them whensoever they appeared for to walk abroad. So when the people upon the walls beheld who those knights were, and when they perceived that white champion who had aforetime brought them such exceeding honour, they shouted aloud for the second time with a voice mightier than that with which they had the first time shouted. Now King Leodegrance heard the people shouting, whereupon hope awoke of a sudden within him. So he straightway came forth with all speed for to see what was ado, and there he beheld those five noble champions about to enter into the field below the castle walls. And the Lady Guinevere also heard the shouting, and she came forth likewise, and behold, there was that white champion and those four other knights. So when she beheld that white knight and his four companions at arms, her heart was like to break within her for pure joy and gladness, wherefore she wept for the passion thereof, and laughed the whiles she wept. And she waved her kerchief unto those five noble lords, and kissed her hand unto them, and the five knights saluted her as they rode past her and into the field. Now when the Duke of Northumber was made aware that those five knights had come against him and his knight's companion, for to take up his challenge, he straightway came forth from his pavilion and mounted his horse. And his knight's companion came forth and mounted their horses, and he and they went forth for to meet those who had come against them. And when the Duke of Northumber had come nigh enough, he perceived that the chiefest of those five knights was the white champion, who had aforetime overthrown him. Wherefore he said unto that white champion, Sir knight, I have once before condescended unto thee, who art altogether unknown to me or to anybody else that is here. For without inquiring concerning thy quality, I ran a course with thee, and lo, by the chance of arms thou didst overthrow me. Now this quarrel is more serious than that. Wherefore I and my companions at arms will not run a course with thee and thy companions, nor will we fight with thee until I first know what is the quality of him against whom I contend. Wherefore I bid thee presently declare thyself, who thou art, and what is thy condition. Then Sir Gawain opened the umbril of his helmet, and he said, Sir Knight, behold my face, and know that I am Gawain, the son of King Lot. 
wherefore thou mayst perceive that my condition and estate are even better than thine own. Now I do declare unto thee that yonder white knight is of such a quality that he condescends unto thee when he doeth combat with thee, and that thou dost not condescend unto him. O oh, Sir Gawain, quoth the Duke of Umber, what thou sayest is a very strange thing, for indeed there are few in this world who are so exalted that they may condescend unto me. Nevertheless, since thou dost avouch for him, I may not gainsay that which thou sayest. Yet there is still another reason why we may not fight with ye. For behold, we are seven well-approved and famous knights, and ye are but five. So consider how unequal are our forces, and that you stand in great peril in undertaking so dangerous an encounter. Then Sir Gawain smiled right grimly upon that Duke of Northumber. Gramercy for thy compassion, and for the tenderness which thou showest concerning our safety, Sir Duke, quoth he. But nevertheless thou mayest leave that matter unto us, with entire content of spirit upon thy part. For I consider that the peril in which ye seven stand is fully equal to our peril. Moreover, wert thou other than a belted knight, a simple man might suppose that thou wert more careful of thine own safety in this matter than thou art of ours. Now at these words the countenance of the Duke of Northumber became altogether covered with red, for he wist that he had indeed no great desire for this battle, wherefore he was ashamed because of the words which Sir Gawain spake to him. So each knight closed his helmet, and all turned their horses, and the one party rode unto one end of the field, and the other party rode to the other end of the field, and there each took stand in the place assigned unto them. And they arranged themselves thus. In the middle was King Arthur, and upon either hand were two knights, and in the middle was the Duke of Northumber, and upon either hand were three knights. So when they had thus arrayed themselves, they dressed their spears and their shields, and made them altogether ready for the onset. Then King Arthur and Duke Mordaunt each shouted aloud, and the one party hurled upon the other party with such violence that the ground shook and thundered beneath the hoofs of the horses, and the clouds of dust rose up against the heavens. And so they met in the middle of the field with an uproar of such dreadful violence that one might have heard the crashing thereof for the distance of more than a mile away. And when the one party had passed the other, and the dust of the encounter had arisen, lo, three of the seven had been overthrown, and not one of the five had lost his seat. And one of those who had been overthrown was Duke Mordaunt of North Umber, and behold, he never more arose again from the ground whereon he lay. For King Arthur had directed his spear into the very midst of his defences, and the spear had held, wherefore the point thereof had pierced the shield of the Duke of North Umber, and had pierced his body armour, and so violent was the stroke that the Duke of North Umber had been lifted entirely out of his saddle, and had been cast a full spear's length behind the crupper of his horse. Thus died that wicked man, for as King Arthur drave past him, the evil soul of him quitted his body with a weak noise like to the squeaking of a bat, and the world was well rid of him. Now when King Arthur turned him about at the end of the course, and beheld that there were but four knights left upon their horses of all those seven against whom he and his companions had driven, he uplifted his spear, and drew rein upon his horse, and bespake his knights in this wise. Messias, I am aweary of all this coil and quarrelling, and do not care to fight any more to-day. So go ye straightway, and engage those knights in battle. As for me, I will abide here, and witness your adventure. Lord, said they, we will do our endeavour as thou dost command. So those four good knights did as he commanded, and they went forth straightway against those other four, much encouraged that their king looked upon their endeavour. And King Arthur sat with the butt of his spear resting upon his instep, and looked upon the field with great content of spirit, and a steadfast countenance. As for those four knights' companion that remained of the Duke of Northumber's party, they came not forth to this second encounter with so much readiness of spirit as they had done aforetime. For they were now well aware of how great was the excellent prowess of those other knights, and they beheld that their enemies came forth to this second encounter very fiercely, and with great valour and readiness of spirit. Wherefore their hearts melted away within them with doubt and anxiety as to the outcome of this second encounter. Nevertheless, they prepared themselves with such resolve as might be, 
and came forth as they were called upon to do. Then Sir Gawain drave straight up to the foremost knight, who was a very well-known champion, hight Sir Denador of Montcalm. And when he had come sufficiently nigh to him, he lifted himself up in his stirrups, and he smote Sir Denador so fierce a blow that he cleft the shield of that knight asunder, and he cleft his helmet, and a part of the blade of his sword brake away and remained therein. And when Sir Denador felt that blow, his brain swam like water, and he was fain to catch the horn of his saddle for to save himself from falling therefrom. Then a great terror straightway fell upon him, so that he drew rein violently to one side. So he fled away from that place with the terror of death hanging above him, like to a black cloud of smoke. And when his companions beheld that stroke that Sir Gawain delivered, and when they beheld Sir Denador flee away from before him, they also drew rein to one side, and fled away with all speed, pursued with an entire terror of their enemies. And Sir Gawain and Sir Erwin and Sir Geraint and Sir Pelias pursued them as they fled. And they chased them straight through the court of King Ryance, so that the knights and nobles of that court scattered hither and thither like chaff at their coming. And they chased those fleeing knights in among the pavilions of King Ryance's court, and no man stayed them. And when they had chased those knights entirely away, they returned to that place where King Arthur still held his station, steadfastly awaiting them. Now when the people of Cameliard beheld the overthrow of their enemies, and when they beheld how those enemies fled away from before the faces of their champions, they shouted with might and main and made great acclaim. Nor did they stint their loud shouting when those four knights returned from pursuing their enemies, and came back unto the white champion again. And still more did they give acclaim when those five knights rode across the drawbridge, and into the gateway of the town, and into the town. Thus ended the great bout at arms, which was one of the most famous in all the history of chivalry of King Arthur's court. Now when King Arthur had thus accomplished his purposes, and when he had come into the town again, he went unto that merchant of whom he had obtained the armor that he wore, and he delivered that armor back to him again. And he said, "'Tomorrow day, Sir Merchant, I shall send thee two bags of gold for the rent of that armor which thou didst let me have.' To this the merchant said, "'Lord, it is not needed that thou shouldst recompense me for that armor, for thou hast done great honor unto Cameliard by thy prowess. But King Arthur said, Have done, Sir Merchant, nor must thou forbid what I say, wherefore take thou that which I shall send unto thee. Thereupon he went his way, and having set his cap of disguise upon his head, he came back into the Lady Guinevere's gardens again. Now when the next morning had come, the people of Cameliard looked forth, and lo, King Ryance had departed entirely away from before the castle. For that night he had struck his pavilions, and had withdrawn his court, and had gone away from that place where he and his people had sat down for five days past. And with him he had taken the body of the Duke of Northumber, conveying it away in a litter surrounded by many lighted candles, and uplifted by a peculiar pomp of ceremony. But when the people of Cameliard beheld that he was gone, they were exceedingly rejoiced, and made merry, and shouted, and sang, and laughed, for they wist not how deeply enraged King Ryance was against them. For his enmity aforetime toward King Leodegrance was but as a small flame when compared unto the anger that now possessed him. End of section 18of the story of King Arthur and his knights. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of King Arthur and His Knights by Howard Pyle The Book of King Arthur, Part 3 The Winning of a Queen Chapter 5, Part 2 Now that morning Lady Guinevere walked into her garden, and with her walked Sir Gawain and Sir Ewan, and lo, there she beheld the gardener's boy again. Then she laughed aloud, and she said unto those two knights, Messiahs, behold, yonder is the gardener's boy, who weareth his cap continually, because he hath an ugly place upon his head. 
then those two knights knowing who that gardener's boy was were exceedingly abashed at her speech and wist not what to say or whither to look and sir gawain spoke aside unto sir ewan and quoth he for heaven that lady knoweth not what manner of man is yonder gardener's boy for an she did she would be more sparing of her speech and the lady guinevere heard sir gawain that he spoke but she did not hear his words so she turned unto sir gawain and she said sir gawain haply it doth affront thee that that gardener's boy should wear his cap before us and maybe thou wilt go and take it off from his head as thou didst offer to do two or three days since and sir gawain said peace lady thou knowest not what thou sayest yonder gardener's boy could more easily take my head from off my shoulders than i could take his cap from off his head at this the lady guinevere made open laughter but in her heart she secretly pondered that saying and greatly marvelled what sir gawain meant thereby now about noon of that day there came an herald from king ryans of north wales and he appeared boldly before king leodegrance where the king sat in his hall with a number of his people about him and the herald said my lord king my master king ryans of north wales is greatly displeased with thee for thou didst set certain knights upon duke mordaunt of north umber and those knights have slain that excellent nobleman who was close kin unto king ryans moreover thou hast made no reply to those demands that my master king ryans hath made touching the delivery unto him of certain lands and castles bordering upon north wales wherefore my master is affronted with thee beyond measure so my master king ryans bids me to set forth to thee two conditions and the conditions are these firstly that thou dost immediately deliver into his hands that white knight who slew the duke of north umber secondly that thou makest immediate promise that those lands in question shall be presently delivered unto king ryans then king leodegrance arose from where he sat and spake to that herald with great dignity of demeanour sir herald quoth he the demands that king ryans maketh upon me pass all bounds for insolence that death which the duke of north umber suffered he suffered because of his own pride and folly nor would i deliver that white knight into thy master's hands even an i were able to do so as for those lands that thy master demandeth of me thou mayst tell king ryans that i will not deliver unto him of those lands so much as a single blade of grass or a single grain of corn that groweth thereon and the herald said if so be that is thine answer king leodegrance then i am bidden for to tell thee that my master king ryans of north wales will presently come hither with an array of a great force of arms and will take from thee by force those things which thou wilt not deliver unto him peacefully whereupon so saying he departed thence and went his way now after the herald had departed king leodegrance went into his closet and when he had come there he sent privily for the lady guinevere so the lady guinevere came to him where he was and king leodegrance said to her my daughter it hath happened that a knight clad all in white and bearing no crest or device of any sort hath twice come to our rescue and hath overthrown our enemies now it is said by everybody that that knight is thine own particular champion and i hear say that he wore thy necklace as a favour when he first went out against the duke of north umber now i prithee daughter tell me who that white champion is and where he may be found then the lady guinevere was overwhelmed with a confusion wherefore she looked away from her father's countenance and she said verily my lord i know not who that knight may be then king leodegrance spake very seriously to the lady guinevere and he took her by the hand and said my daughter thou art now of an age when thou must consider being mated unto a man who may duly cherish thee and protect thee from thine enemies for lo i grow apace in years and may not hope to defend thee always from those perils that encompass one of our estate moreover since king arthur who is a very great king indeed hath brought peace unto this realm all that noble court of chivalry which one time gathered about me has been scattered elsewhither where greater adventures may be found than in my peaceful realm 
Wherefore, as all the world has seen this week past, I have now not one single knight whom I may depend upon to defend us in such times of peril as these which now overshadow us. Now, my daughter, it doth appear to me that thou couldst not hope to find any one who could so well safeguard thee as this white knight, for he doth indeed appear to be a champion of extraordinary prowess and strength. Wherefore it would be well if thou didst feel thyself to incline unto him, as he appeareth to incline unto thee. Then the Lady Guinevere became all rosy red, as with a fire even unto her throat, and she laughed, albeit the tears overflowed her eyes and ran down upon her cheeks. So she wept, yet laughed in weeping, and she said unto King Leodegrance, My lord and father, and I give my liking unto any one in the manner thou speaketh of, I will give it only unto the poor gardener's boy, who digs in my garden. Then at these words the countenance of King Leodegrance became contracted with violent anger, and he cried out, Ha, lady, wouldst thou make a mock and a jest of my words? Then the Lady Guinevere said, Indeed, my lord, I jest not, and I mock not. Moreover, I tell thee for verity, that that same gardener's boy knoweth more concerning the white champion than anybody else in all of the world. Then King Leodegrance said, What is this that thou tellest me? And the Lady Guinevere said, Send for that gardener's boy, and thou shalt know. And King Leodegrance said, Verily, there is more in this than I may at present understand. So he called to him the chief of his pages, hight Dorasand, and he said to him, Go, Dorasand, and bring hither the gardener's boy from the Lady Guinevere's garden. So Dorasand the page went as King Leodegrance commanded, and in a little while he returned, bringing with him that gardener's boy. And with them came Sir Gawain, and Sir Ewan, and Sir Pelias, and Sir Geraint, and those four lords stood over against the door where they entered. But the gardener's boy came, and stood beside the table where King Leodegrance sat. And the king lifted up his eyes, and looked upon the gardener's boy, and he said, Ha! wouldst thou wear thy cap in our presence? Then the gardener's boy said, I cannot take off my cap. But the Lady Guinevere, who stood beside the chair of King Leodegrance, spake and said, I do beseech thee, Messire, for to take off thy cap unto my father. Whereupon the gardener's boy said, At thy bidding I will take it off. So he took the cap from off his head, and King Leodegrance beheld his face and knew him. And when he saw who it was who stood before him, he made a great outcry from pure amazement, and he said, My lord and my king, what is this? Thereupon he arose from where he sat, and he went and kneeled down upon the ground before King Arthur. And he set the palms of his hands together, and he put his hands within the hands of King Arthur, and King Arthur took the hands of King Leodegrance within his own. And King Leodegrance said, My lord, my lord, is it then thou who hast done all these wonderful things? Then King Arthur said, Yea, such as those things were, I have done them. And he stooped and kissed King Leodegrance upon the cheek, and lifted him up unto his feet, and gave him words of good cheer. Now the Lady Guinevere, when she beheld those things that passed, was astonished beyond measure. And lo, she understood of a sudden all these things with amazing clearness. Wherefore a great fear fell upon her, so that she trembled exceedingly, and said unto herself, What things have I said unto this great king, and how have I made a mock of him, and a jest of him, before all those who were about me? and at the thought thereof she set her hand upon her side for to still the extreme disturbance of her heart. So whilst King Arthur and King Leodegrance gave to one another words of royal greeting and of compliment, she withdrew herself, and went and stood over against the window nigh to the corner of the wall. Then by and by King Arthur lifted up his eyes and beheld her where she stood afar off. So he went straightway unto her, and he took her by the hand, and he said, Lady, what cheer? And she said, Lord, I am afeard of thy greatness. And he said, Nay, lady, rather it is I who am afeard of thee, for thy kind regard is dearer unto me than anything else in all the world, else had I not served for these twelve days as gardener's boy in thy garden, all for the sake of thy good will. 
And she said, Thou hast my good will, Lord. And he said, Have I thy good will in great measure? And she said, Yea, thou hast it in great measure. Then he stooped his head and kissed her before all those who were there, and thus their troth was plighted. Then King Leodegrance was filled with such an exceeding joy that he wist not how to contain himself therefore. Now after these things there followed a war with King Ryance of North Wales. For Sir Kay and Sir Elpheus had gathered together a great army as King Arthur had bidden them to do, so that when King Ryance came against Cameliard he was altogether routed, and his army dispersed, and he himself chased an outcast into his mountains. Then there was great rejoicing in Cameliard, for after his victory King Arthur remained there for a while with an exceedingly splendid court of noble lords and of beautiful ladies, and there was feasting and jousting and many famous bouts at arms, the like of which those parts had never before beheld. And King Arthur and the Lady Guinevere were altogether happy together. Now one day, whilst King Arthur sat at feast with King Leodegrance, they too being exceedingly expanded with cheerfulness, King Leodegrance said unto King Arthur, My lord, what shall I offer thee for a dowry with my daughter, when thou takest her away from me for to be thy queen? Then King Arthur turned to Merlin, who stood nigh to him, and he said, Ha, Merlin, what shall I demand of my friend by way of that dowry? Unto him Merlin said, My lord king, thy friend King Leodegrance hath one thing, the which, should he bestow it upon thee, will singularly increase the glory and renown of thy reign, so that the fame thereof shall never be forgotten. And King Arthur said, I bid thee, Merlin, tell me what is that thing. So Merlin said, My lord king, I will tell thee a story. In the days of thy father, Uther Pendragon, I caused to be made for him a certain table, in the shape of a ring, wherefore men called it the round table. Now at this table were seats for fifty men, and these seats were designed for the fifty knights, who were the most worthy knights in all the world. These seats were of such a sort that whenever a worthy knight appeared, then his name appeared in letters of gold upon that seat that appertained unto him. And when that knight died, then would his name suddenly vanish from that seat, which he had aforetime occupied. Now forty and nine of these seats, except one seat, were altogether alike, saving only one that was set aside for the king himself, which same was elevated above the other seats, and was cunningly carved and inlaid with ivory and with gold. And the one seat was different from all the others, and it was called the Seat Perilous. For this seat was unlike the others, both in its structure and its significance, for it was all cunningly inset with gold and silver of curious device, and it was covered with a canopy of satin embroidered with gold and silver, and it was altogether of a wonderful magnificence of appearance. And no name ever appeared upon this seat, for only one knight in all of the world could hope to sit therein with safety unto himself. For if any other dared to sit therein, either he would die a sudden and violent death within three days' time, or else a great misfortune would befall him. Hence that seat was called the Seat Perilous. Now in the days of King Uther Pendragon there sat seven and thirty knights at the round table. And when King Uther Pendragon died, he gave the round table unto his friend, King Leodegrance of Cameliard. And in the beginning of King Leodegrance's reign, there sat four and twenty knights at the round table. But times have changed since then, and the glory of King Leodegrance's reign hath paled before the glory of thy reign, so that his noble court of knights have altogether quitted him. Wherefore there remaineth now not one name, saving only the name of King Leodegrance upon all those fifty seats that surround the round table. So now that round table lieth beneath its pavilion altogether unused. Yet if King Leodegrance will give unto thee, my lord king, that round table for a dower with the Lady Guinevere, then will it lend unto thy reign its greatest glory. For in thy day every seat of that table shall be filled, even unto the seat perilous, and the fame of the knights who sit at it shall never be forgotten. Ha! quoth King Arthur, 
that would indeed be a dower worthy for any king to have with his queen. Then King Leodegrant said, That dower shalt thou have with my daughter, and if it bring thee great glory, then shall thy glory be my glory, and thy renown shall be my renown. For if my glory shall wane, and thy glory shall increase, behold, is not my child thy wife? And King Arthur said, Thou sayest well and wisely. And thus King Arthur became the master of that famous round table, and the round table was set up at Camelot, which some men now call Winchester. And by and by there gathered about it such an array of knights as the world had never beheld before that time, and which it shall never behold again. Such was the history of the beginning of the round table in King Arthur's reign. End of section 19section twenty of the story of king arthur and his knights this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. the story of king arthur and his knights by howard pyle the book of king arthur part three the winning of a queen Chapter Sixth and Conclusion Chapter Sixth How King Arthur was wedded in royal state, and how the round table was established. And now was come the early fall of the year, that pleasant season when the meadowland and the wold were still green with summer that had only just passed, when the sky likewise was as of summer-time, extraordinarily blue and full of large floating clouds, when a bird might sing here and another there, a short song in memory of springtime, when all the air was tempered with warmth, and yet the leaves were everywhere turning brown and red and gold, so that when the sun shone through them it was as though a cloth of gold, broidered with brown and crimson and green, hung above the head. At this season of the year it is exceedingly pleasant to be afield among the nut-trees with hawk and hound, or to travel abroad in the yellow world, whether it be a horse or a foot. Now this was the time of the year in which had been set the marriage of King Arthur and the Lady Guinevere at Camelot, and at that place was extraordinary pomp and glory of circumstance. All the world was astir and in a great ferment of joy, for everybody was exceedingly glad that King Arthur was to have him a queen. In preparation for that great occasion, the town of Camelot was bedight very magnificently, for the stony street along which the Lady Guinevere must come to the royal castle of the king was strewn thick with fresh-cut rushes smoothly laid. Moreover, it was in many places spread with carpets of excellent pattern, such as might be fit to lay upon the floor of some goodly hall. Likewise, all the houses along the way were hung with fine hangings of woven texture, interwoven with threads of azure and crimson, and everywhere were flags and banners afloat in the warm and gentle breeze against the blue sky. Wherefore, that all the world appeared to be alive with bright colours, so that when one looked adown that street, it was as though one beheld a crooked path of exceeding beauty and gaiety stretched before him. Thus came the wedding day of the king, bright and clear and exceedingly radiant. King Arthur sat in his hall, surrounded by his court, awaiting news that the Lady Guinevere was coming thitherward. And it was about the middle of the morning when there came a messenger in haste, riding upon a milk-white steed and the raiment of that messenger and the trappings of his horse were all of cloth of gold embroidered with scarlet and white, and the tabard of the messenger was set with many jewels of various sorts, so that he glistened from afar as he rode, with a singular splendor of appearance. So this herald messenger came straight into the castle where the king abided waiting, and he said, Arise, my lord king, for the Lady Guinevere and her court draweth nigh unto this place. 
Upon this the king immediately arose with great joy, and straightway he went forth with his court of knights, riding in great state. And as he went down that marvellously adorned street, all the people shouted aloud as he passed by, wherefore he smiled and bent his head from side to side. For that day he was passing happy, and loved his people with wonderful friendliness. Thus he rode forward unto the town gate, and out therefrom, and so came thence into the country beyond where the broad and well-beaten highway ran winding down beside the shining river betwixt the willows and the osiers. And, behold, King Arthur and those with him perceived the court of the princess, where it appeared at a distance, wherefore they made great rejoicing and hastened forward with all speed. And as they came nigh, the sun, falling upon the apparels of silk and cloth of gold, and upon golden chains and the jewels that hung therefrom, all of that noble company that surrounded the Lady Guinevere, her litter, flashed and sparkled with surpassing radiance. For seventeen of the noblest knights of the king's court, clad in complete armor and sent by him as an escort unto the lady, rode in great splendor surrounding the litter wherein the princess lay. And the framework of that litter was of richly gilded wood, and its curtains and its cushions were of crimson silk embroidered with threads of gold. And behind the litter there rode in gay and joyous array, all shining with many colors, the court of the princess, her damsels in waiting, gentlemen, ladies, pages, and attendants. So those parties of the king and the Lady Guinevere drew nigh together, until they met and mingled the one with the other. Then straightway King Arthur dismounted from his noble horse, and, all clothed with royalty, he went afoot unto the Lady Guinevere's litter, while Sir Gawain and Sir Ewen held the bridle of his horse. Thereupon one of her pages drew aside the silken curtains of the Lady Guinevere's litter, and King Leodegrance gave her his hand, and she straightway descended therefrom, all embalmed, as it were, in exceeding beauty. So King Leodegrance led her to King Arthur, and King Arthur came to her and placed one hand beneath her chin, and the other upon her head, and inclined his countenance, and kissed her upon her smooth cheek, all warm and fragrant like velvet for softness, and without any blemish whatsoever. And when he had thus kissed her upon the cheek, all those who were there lifted up their voices in great acclaim, giving loud voice of joy that those two noble souls had thus met together. Thus did King Arthur give welcome unto the Lady Guinevere, and unto King Leodegrance her father upon the highway beneath the walls of the town of Camelot, at the distance of half a league from that place. And no one who was there ever forgot that meeting, for it was full of extraordinary grace and noble courtliness. Then King Arthur and his court of knights and nobles brought King Leodegrance and the Lady Guinevere with great ceremony unto Camelot, and unto the royal castle, where apartments were assigned to all, so that the entire place was alive with joyousness and beauty. And when high noon had come, the entire court went with great state and ceremony unto the cathedral, and there, surrounded with wonderful magnificence, those two noble souls were married by the archbishop. And all the bells rang right joyfully, and all the people who stood without the cathedral shouted with loud acclaim, and lo, the king and the queen came forth all shining, like unto the sun for splendor, and like unto the moon for beauty. In the castle a great noontide feast was spread, and there sat thereat four hundred eighty and six lordly and noble folk, kings, knights, and nobles, with queens and ladies in magnificent array. And near to the king and the queen, there sat King Leodegrance and Merlin, and Sir Ulfius, and Sir Ector the Trustworthy, and Sir Gawain, and Sir Ewen, and Sir Kay, and King Ban, and King Pellinore, and many other famous and exalted folk so that no man had ever beheld such magnificent courtliness as he had beheld at that famous wedding feast of King Arthur and Queen Guinevere. And that day was likewise very famous in the history of chivalry, for in the afternoon the famous round table was established, and that round table 
was at once the very flower and the chiefest glory of King Arthur's reign. For about mid of the afternoon the king and queen, preceded by Merlin and followed by all that splendid court of kings, lords, nobles, and knights in full array, made progression to that place, where Merlin, partly by magic and partly by skill, had caused to be builded a very wonderful pavilion above the round table where it stood. And when the king and the queen and the court had entered in thereat, they were amazed at the beauty of that pavilion, for they perceived, and it were, a great space that appeared to be a marvellous land of fay, for the walls were all richly gilded, and were painted with very wonderful figures of saints and of angels, clad in ultramarine and crimson, and all those saints and angels were depicted playing upon various musical instruments that appeared to be made of gold. And overhead the roof of the pavilion was made to represent the sky, being all of cerulean blue sprinkled over with stars. And in the midst of that painted sky was an image, and it were, of the sun in his glory. And underfoot was a pavement, all of marble stone, set in squares of black and white, and blue and red, and sundry other colours. In the midst of the pavilion was a round table, with seats thereat exactly sufficient for fifty persons, and at each of the fifty places was a chalice of gold filled with fragrant wine, and at each place was a pattern of gold bearing a manchet of fair white bread. And when the king and his court entered the pavilion, lo, music began of a sudden for to play with a wonderful sweetness. Then Merlin came and took King Arthur by the hand and led him away from Queen Guinevere, and he said unto the king, Lo, this is the round table. Then King Arthur said, Merlin, that which I see is wonderful beyond the telling. After that Merlin discovered unto the king the various marvels of the round table, for first he pointed to a high seat, very wonderfully wrought in precious woods, and gilded so that it was exceedingly beautiful, and he said, Behold, Lord King, yonder seat is height, the seat royal, and that seat is thine for to sit in. And as Merlin spake, lo, there suddenly appeared sundry letters of gold upon the back of that seat, and the letters of gold read the name, Arthur, King. And Merlin said, Lord, yonder seat may well be called the center seat of the round table, for in sooth thou art indeed the very center of all that is most worthy of true knightliness. Wherefore that seat shall be called the center seat of all the other seats. Then Merlin pointed to the seat that stood opposite to the seat royal, and that seat also was of a very wonderful appearance as aforetold in this history. And Merlin said unto the king, My lord king, that seat is called the seat perilous, for no man but one in all this world shall sit therein, and that man is not yet born upon the earth. And if any other man shall dare to sit therein, that man shall either suffer death, or a sudden and terrible misfortune for his temerity. Wherefore that seat is called the seat perilous. Merlin, quoth the king, all that thou tellest me passeth the bound of understanding for marvellousness. Now I do beseech thee in all haste, for to find forthwith a sufficient number of knights to fill this round table so that my glory shall be entirely complete. Then Merlin smiled upon the king, though not with cheerfulness, and said, Lord, why art thou in such haste? Know that when this round table shall be entirely filled in all its seats, then shall thy glory be entirely achieved, and then forthwith shall thy day begin for to decline. For when any man hath reached the crowning of his glory, then his work is done, and God breaketh him as a man might break a chalice, from which such perfect ichor hath been drunk, that no baser wine may be allowed to defile it. So when thy work is done and ended, shall God shatter the chalice of thy life. Then did the king look very steadfastly into Merlin's face, and said, Old man, that which thou sayest is ever of great wonder, for thou speakest words of wisdom. Nevertheless, seeing that I am in God his hands, I do wish for my glory and for his good will to be accomplished, 
even though he shall then entirely break me, when I have served his purposes. Lord, said Merlin, thou speakest like a worthy king, and with a very large and noble heart. Nevertheless, I may not fill the round table for thee at this time. For though thou hast gathered about thee the very noblest court of chivalry in all of Christendom, yet are there but two and thirty knights here present, who may be considered worthy to sit at the round table. Then, Merlin, quoth King Arthur, I do desire of thee that thou shalt straightway choose me those two and thirty. So will I do, Lord King, said Merlin. Then Merlin cast his eyes around, and lo, he saw where King Pellinore stood at a little distance. Unto him went Merlin, and took him by the hand. Behold, my lord king, quoth he, here is the knight in all the world next to thyself, who at this time is most worthy for to sit at this round table. For he is both exceedingly gentle of demeanour unto the poor and needy, and at the same time is so terribly strong and skilful, that I know not whether thou or he is the more to be feared in an encounter of knight against knight. Then Merlin led King Pellinore forward, and behold, upon the high seat that stood upon the left hand of the royal seat, there appeared of a sudden the name Pellinore, and the name was emblazoned in letters of gold that shone with extraordinary lustre. And when King Pellinore took his seat, great and loud acclaim long continued was given him by all those who stood round about. Then after that Merlin had thus chosen King Arthur and King Pellinore, he chose out of the court of King Arthur the following knights, two and thirty in all, and these were the knights of great renown in chivalry who did first establish the round table. Wherefore they were surnamed the Ancient and Honourable Companions of the Round Table. To begin, there was Sir Gawain and Sir Ewan, who were nephews unto the king, and they sat nigh to him upon the right hand. There was Sir Ulfius, who held his seat but four years and eight months unto the time of his death, after which Sir Geheris, who was esquire unto his brother Sir Gawain, held that seat. And there was Sir Kay the Seneschal, who was foster brother unto the king, and there was Sir Baudwain of Britain, who held his seat but three years and two months until his death, after the which Sir Agravaine held that seat. And there was Sir Pelias and Sir Geraint and Sir Constantine, son of Sir Cadarez, the Seneschal of Cornwall, which same was king after King Arthur. And there was Sir Caradoc and Sir Sagramor, surnamed the Desirous, and Sir Dinadan and Sir Dodinas, surnamed the Savage, and Sir Bruin, surnamed the Black, and Sir Meliot of Logres, and Sir Aglaval, and Sir Durnore, and Sir Lamorak, which three young knights were sons of King Pellinore. And there was Sir Griflet, and Sir Ladinas, and Sir Brandiles, and Sir Persavant of Ironside, and Sir Dinas of Cornwall, and Sir Brian of Listinois, and Sir Palamides, and Sir de Grain, and Sir Epinogres, the son of the King of Northumberland, and brother unto the enchantress Vivian, and Sir Lamiel of Cardiff, and Sir Lucan the Bottler, and Sir Bedivere his brother, which same bare King Arthur unto the ship of fairies, when he lay so sorely wounded nigh unto death, after the last battle which he fought. These two and thirty knights were the ancient companions of the round table, and unto them were added others until there were nine and forty in all, and then was added Sir Galahad, and with him the round table was made entirely complete. Now as each of these knights was chosen by Merlin, lo, as he took that knight by the hand, the name of that knight suddenly appeared in golden letters, very bright and shining upon the seat that appertained to him. But when all had been chosen, behold, King Arthur saw that the seat upon the right hand of the seat royal had not been filled, and that it bare no name upon it. And he said unto Merlin, Merlin, how is this, that the seat upon my right hand hath not been filled, and beareth no name? And Merlin said, Lord, there shall be a name thereon, in a very little while, and he who shall sit therein shall be the greatest knight in all the world, until that the knight cometh who shall occupy the seat perilous. For he who cometh shall exceed all other men in beauty and in strength and in knightly grace. And King Arthur said, I would that he were with us now. And Merlin said, He cometh anon. 
Thus was the round table established with great pomp and great ceremony of estate. For first the Archbishop of Canterbury blessed each and every seat, progressing from place to place surrounded by his holy court, the choir whereof singing most musically in accord, whilst others swung censers from which there ascended an exceedingly fragrant vapour of frankincense, filling that entire pavilion with an odour of heavenly blessedness. And when the archbishop had thus blessed every one of those seats, the chosen knight took each his stall at the round table, and his esquire came and stood behind him, holding the banneret with his coat of arms upon the spear-point above the knight's head. And all those who stood about that place, both knights and ladies, lifted up their voices in loud acclaim. Then all the knights arose, and each knight held up before him the cross of the hilt of his sword, and each knight spake word for word as King Arthur spake. And this was the covenant of their knighthood of the round table, that they would be gentle unto the weak, that they would be courageous unto the strong, that they would be terrible unto the wicked and the evildoer, that they would defend the helpless who should call upon them for aid, that all women should be held unto them sacred, that they would stand unto the defence of one another whensoever such defence should be required, that they would be merciful unto all men, that they would be gentle of deed, true in friendship, and faithful in love. This was their covenant, and unto it each knight sware upon the cross of his sword, and in witness thereof did kiss the hilt thereof. Thereupon all who stood thereabouts once more gave loud acclaim. Then all the knights of the round table seated themselves, and each knight brake bread from the golden paten, and quaffed wine from the golden chalice that stood before him, giving thanks unto God for that which he ate and drank. Thus was King Arthur wedded unto Queen Guinevere, and thus was the round table established. Conclusion so endeth this book of King Arthur, which hath been told by me with such joyousness of spirit that I find it to be a very great pleasure, in closing this first volume of my work, to look forward to writing a second volume, which now presently followeth. In that volume there shall be told the history of several very noble worthies who were of the court of the king, and it seems to me to be a good thing to have to do with the history of such noble and honourable knights and gentlemen. For indeed it might well please any one to read such an history, and to hear those worthies speak, and to behold in what manner they behaved in times of trial and tribulation. For their example will doubtless help us all to behave in a like manner in a like case. End of section 20